What is poppin' everybody? Welcome to The Mix Next. My name is Justin Woodward, co-founder of the Media Indie Exchange, The Mix, and the uh, Interbang Entertainment Squad Independent Studio. It has been a crazy 2020, and we want to shed light on some indie games, uh, on some fun. And first, I want to introduce my co-host, Katie Williams. Thanks for having me, Justin. Hey, everyone. My name is Katie. Um, I've been in the games industry for a decade now. I was a games journalist at places like IGN, PC Gamer, several print magazines. I worked at Google Play, uh, giving Editor's Choice Awards to games that I really loved. But what has kept me in the industry so long has been indie games. It's where I started. It's where I feel I was born as a games person. I just love indie games so much. They're so unique and you know if they have such brilliant ideas they really push boundaries and um i don't know i'd love to hear what you love about indie games as well you're an indie game developer yourself yeah i've been i've been in the space i started in AAA, worked in indie games for the past 10 years multiple projects and then we started the mix eight years ago um because we wanted to help our friends in the indie space and it's, it's like a tribe you know all yeah. this is family everyone here we, we're in b the beautiful wilmer sounds we met through uh, the IGDA and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's like a family, you know? Yeah, yeah, in the indie scene, we're all really close-knit. I mean, the reason I got into games was because I wanted to share the games that I loved so much with everyone, everyone I could. Yeah, so we have uh, an amazing lineup, 50 games. We have exclusive trailers, interviews, and then Katie and I will be playing games and interviewing our guests to kind of show you how the sausage is made. Uh, but first off, this could not be possible if it weren't from our sponsors. So let's let's shed light on our sponsors: Humble Games, Modern Wolf, Tiny Build. Uh, we got Akupura, another indie, Astro, Goblins, Graffiti Games, Head Up, uh, Kickstarter, Razor, Super, those awesome guys, Whitethorn. And we also want to. Um, uh, to thank our streaming partners, Twitch, IGN, GameSpot is hosting our who are hosting our streams, and of course we cannot forget Steam. And speaking of Steam, we have a Mix Next Steam page where you can wish list the games, show them love, play their demos, and buy them. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and show them love. Um, we want to kick this off proper. I want to introduce a guest who is a friend of the mix. We work with him on the Gorilla Collective and then previous mix events, our friend and the lovely Greg Miller. What's up, everybody? It's me, Greg Miller from YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games here to help you get ready for the mix next. Uh, you know, what they asked me to talk about was like, you know, what are you excited about next? And obviously, all these amazing games you're seeing that I hope you'll go uh, wish list and support and follow on Twitter and take care of uh, the bed and breakfast bear game. Come on. Um, but in general, when I think about, you know, what I'm excited for in the future for games, especially independent games, is this new generation of consoles and what it means i think because again you know playstation 5 xbox series x xbox as an ecosystem games pass right i really think it gets interesting as to what are the benefits for these going to be for developers i think the fact that these consoles are huge shifts in terms of technology they are you know more of a an upgrade from where we are makes it easier to develop on i think that the ease of access to them what we've already seen the way xbox is helping out indies the way playstation continues to improve their systems to make it easier to put your games on there that's what gets me excited is the idea that S smaller than ever teams can go out, make a game, can put it on PC as usual, and then bring it over to these consoles and find a brand new audience, right? I think we saw such success this uh, past generation with PlayStation 4 bringing in so many different gamers, selling so many different consoles, and really opening up new avenues. When you think about what Xbox Game Pass is doing, when you think about what Nindies and Nintendo Switch is doing, it's such a great time to be making games right now. And so what gets me excited about all of this new technology, right, uh, is something we keep talking about and kind of funny that next generation isn't about graphics. It isn't about audio. It's about convenience. And I think if we're talking about being able to get your games, you know, these independent games, these games that you're seeing from all these amazing developers, if we're able to see your games get to you, the consumer, faster, if they're able to load faster, if they're able to have l less uh, different hurdles to get to in terms of on Xbox being able to play on any device, multiple boxes, stream it to, from the cloud, uh, that's what's powerful about the next step we're about to take in gaming. Uh, the ability to have all of your digital games at your fingertips is what gets me truly excited about the next generation.
Hey everybody, this is Richard James Cook of Graffiti Games, and today I'm excited to show you an exclusive preview of our upcoming game, Blue Fire, developed by Argentinian-based Roby Studios. Blue Fire begins by introducing you to the dark, mysterious hallways of the fortress known as Penumbra, a floating castle once thriving with life, now crumbled and perished for an eternity of death and darkness. You awaken in a long-abandoned place known as the Fire Keep, unaware of your role in this dark tale. As you make your way deep into the destroyed and deserted corridors, you slowly begin to piece together the events that transpired long ago as you slash through dangerous shadow creatures that swarm the castle. Throughout your journey, you'll explore the many regions within and interact with the ancestors of those who survived the darkness. Numerous descendants forged a new home, rich and vibrant in features unique to their kind. And through them, you'll not only gain a greater understanding of your place here, but also acquire items and powerful equipment that will aid you in your quest. The deeper you get in the castle, the more challenges you'll face, from puzzles and platforms to enemies who continue to grow stronger and ever more persistent to stop you from reaching your goal. You'll have to fight hard, fight smart, watch your step, and keep moving to survive. Part of honing your skills in Blue Fire takes place in the Voids, an ethereal training ground created by the Fire Guard in ancient times in order to train their kind to fight the darkness. Throughout the castle, you'll find several Voids, each more difficult than the last. By completing these Voids, you not only gain a special currency called Void Souls, but also sharpen your skills and gain special unlockables as you progress throughout the game. Besting the many threats you face won't be enough. In order to truly save the castle from the darkness, you'll first have to face the three Shadow Lords that stand in the way and protect their master. Each Lord carries with them immense power, and facing them means exercising every ounce of your skill in order to bring them down and clear your path. And when you are ready, you will face the true bringer of the darkness, the one who protects the castle, known as the Queen herself. How and if you survive this last stand, you can find out when you play Blue Fire, coming early 2021 to PC, Switch, and more. Here we are with another season of RDRA. Where will today's run be? Looks like Lolo Prime. Runner looks rough down there. Good luck, Runner. You'll need it. Oh! Ammo 100% failure rate continues. When cutting edge technology starts to cut like a chainsaw. On the brink of death, one robot factor will learn that some grudges are hard coded. Enter the TV dimension where you'll face off against terrible thieves, vile villains, and ridiculous robots. your robo skills to master your environment and make evil bite the dust. Hide. Protect. Suck. 
battle through the TV dimension, rise from the ashes to avenge your family, and show the world that justice sucks. Justice sucks. Recharge. Hi, this is Winston from Samurai Punk, and this is Justice Sucks Recharged, the game about a killer robot vacuum on a quest for vengeance through a neo-90s multiverse. In this game, you'll be fighting off evildoers by hacking gadgets in your environment, turning them into traps Home Alone style. When you spill their blood, you can suck it up and gain access to the new blood ability system, which I'll be showing you a few examples of today. Blood Ram lets you fly into your enemies like a rocket, unleashing a wide area of effect explosion on impact. Great for mobility and crowd control. Electric Chain allows you to click any two hackable objects and create an electrified tripwire between them. Any enemies that touch it will get a nasty shock. Sexy Punch is a devastating move that summons a muscular spirit that punches one enemy, sending them flying. You can even launch enemies into each other for that sweet bowling ball betrayal. The game has a combo system that rewards you with health drops and points that can be used to purchase even more blood abilities. You'll have plenty of options in the full game, allowing you to customize your ability loadout to suit your playstyle. Each level is rich with possibilities for combos, so experiment with your abilities and everything around you for hilarious and stylish kills. But remember, since you're a vacuum, you gotta clean up the mess afterwards to get that high score. Please check out our demo on Steam, which includes the first level of the game. We really hope you enjoy our unique flavor of vacuum vigilante carnage. Stay tuned for more news later this year, and don't forget to hit that wish list. Much love. See ya. Are you ready to break into some nonsense? Let's go. Ever since I was little, I wanted an afro, so I'm very pleased. Oh, you took the hacker already. Oh, okay, fine. Cool, cool. He has a better beard than me. If you need me, I'll be in cyberspace. Okay, looks like I have to like disable the surveillance. Oh, I see you. Oh, I see you. Hi. I feel like I need to whisper now. <laughs> Partner's assistance needed. It's coming. It's coming. It's so simple yet so complicated. <laughs> Push it real Push good. Push it. Got it. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So, uh, Sharks. if you want to Why are you like this? There's things in the ceiling that I feel are are gonna laser me. Up a scooch. And then to the left a little bit. Uh -huh. Just look on down. Yeah! What? Oh. <laughs> Wait, no. Oh, I knew it! Oh, God. Oh, oh God. God. Oh, I see. 2,500. I got it. 30. No! Uh. 48 was yellow, 70 is blue. Woo! Yeah! And I'm in. All right. I'm in a room with a bunch of squares. Oh, no! No! Your partner fell into the digital void. I was right there. <laughs> I got barely tapped. Three, two, one, spam! I was like, click, 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 click. <laughs> go, 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 go! Yes! Nice. There yeah. we go. That's the stuff. That was hard. <laughs> that was legit hard. But I can't. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Oh, there's so many. I'm running out of gin. We're in trouble. Oh, God. This is really hard. Are you able to switch those puzzles around? I am. Are you sure this is correct? No. Wait, did I do it? We did it. Yes. We did it. Teamwork indeed made the dream work. <laughs> I love the communication. Like, it's. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't wait to play more. Oh, I knew this game was gonna be fucking rad. I cannot wait to play more of this. Yeah. I, I want more. Like, I want to do another mission. <laughs> Operation Tango. Download the demo on Steam. Vigil The Longest Night is an action horror RPG developed by Glass Heart Games and published by Anale Indie. Vigil The Longest Night is launching today on Steam and Nintendo Switch. Vigil The Longest Night follows the story of Leila, a young warrior of the Vigilant Order. 
The vigilant order are holy warriors pledged to defend the innocent from the blight of the endless night. Leila has returned to her hometown, Maine, to investigate mysterious disappearances and deaths in the town. For as long as anyone can remember, the world has endured an endless night. Prayers to the Shimmer Goddess have gone unanswered, and people live in fear of the things less dark the darkness. What Leila discovers in Maine will shape not only her future, but the future of the town, and perhaps her world. We would like to introduce you to some of the stranger items in Vija the Longest Night, the Arcane Items. One of these artifacts is the Hand of Shadow, a prosthetic hand given as a reward to one of Maine's more despondent inhabitants. Its power can hold an enemy motionless for a brief but important moment. Other artifacts have more utility, such as helping discover hidden locations or open new pathways. As Layla becomes more in tune with the arcane powers around her, she will find her arcane items grow with her. Nas blacksmiths can use rare shimmer stones to upgrade Layla's weapons and armor to suit your style of combat. However, a weapon's true power comes with enchantment. The area around me is brimming with resources that can unlock powerful effects for Lela's weapons. Ignite your enemies. Blight them with poison. Reflect their attacks. We hope you've enjoyed our video. Vija the Longest Night is available now on Steam and Nintendo Switch. Welcome to Zelter, a crafting survival game set in a pixelated, zombie-infested post-apocalyptic universe. Here we are, the zombie apocalypse has taken place and luckily we haven't been eaten yet by the zombies that now infest the city. It's time to recall your survival lessons if you don't want to become a treat. Use your skills to craft tools for both survival and defense start your farm production and go out to scavenge resources and save lives. Zombies will eventually come for you, so do everything that you can to prepare yourself and your home. A post-apocalyptic world overrun with zombies has never been so funny. What's more, zombies and other infected species have never looked so cool, especially when they are being ripped apart by your weapon. The city that you live in is full of locations to explore and resources to scavenge. Most objects can be broken up into useful items and you can use those items to upgrade your base or craft something completely new. So take your hammer and try to destroy everything that catches your eye. On your journey you will meet other survivors. If you help them and take them to your home, they will gladly help you upgrade your base. You can direct them to craft essential supplies, guard vital positions, accompany you on your scavenger hunts, and help you build an impenetrable fortress ready for the inevitable zombie attack. 
While at the start of the game, you will be banging rocks against each other simply to create a hatchet. With time, you will unlock a complex crafting system that caters to all of your basic needs, providing you with food, safety, and offensive firepower. Zelter started to gain popularity thanks to a couple of successful crowdfunding campaigns that proved the interest of the community. Now, with thousands of fans, the game is releasing in early access and will continue to gather players' feedback. The main reason for this is the desire to make Zelter a game that will be loved by the players from all over the world, a feat that is impossible without a strong and sustainable connection with the audience. Welcome back! We are just getting warmed up in so many awesome games and titles so far. Uh, we, we, we do want to make an announcement from another Indie Games. Vigil is being released right now, so go pick that up on Steam. Um, I have to say, I, I do have some favorites. All of them were great in that block, but um, uh, Run, Die, Run Again from the legendary Tony Barnes was... It, that that trailer blew me away. I can't... That, that looks gorgeous. Yeah. I, I get a very Deus Ex sort of feel, like original Deus Ex, especially yeah, for in Hong sure. Kong. And, you know... I love that. that. That is one of my favorite classic games. So to kind of see that in a new game is really exciting. Yeah, so what games stood out to you? Um, so I am really fascinated by Justice Sucks Recharged. Um, I actually know the developers from back in Australia. Um, I was actually at the Game Jam where their first game, Screen Cheat, was conceived. And it's been really fun to watch, you know, watch them turn that game, Screen Cheat, into an actual game and then kind of watch their game career progress from there. Yeah, um, yeah. So they've had like the American Dream on VR and now Justice Sucks with uh, this bloodthirsty robot vacuum. <laughs> I, like how you, I like how you <laughs> snuck that in there, yeah. <laughs> Samurai Punk is really cool. We had Screen Sheet back in like 2014, I believe, or 2013 at our first mix events. And then American Dream too. It, it's mm. so awesome to see these teams. Even yeah. uh, Vigil, when we first saw that game, that was years ago, and it was so early on, and looked like such an awesome, um, like uh, Metroidvania style game. And yeah, it's it's just cool and to see these games. Yeah, now it's out today. It's out. It, it, it's <laughs> out. Um, yeah, we want to introduce our next block of games, starting with two titles from our friends and partners, Modern Wolf. In certain other games, you play the role of a perfectly manicured president who never needs to worry about getting their hands dirty. But real governance is messy, and you will not have that luxury. Here in Basenji, the people have broken the chains of a tyrannical monarchy. As president, their fate is now in your hands. Or is it the other way around? The people of Basenji are a patchwork of urban and rural, religious and secular, liberal and conservative, everything you'll need for a model democracy. In the assembly, then... You won't be alone. You will need to appoint ministers. They will have their own agendas that may not line up cleanly with yours. Above all, it's your responsibility to rebuild our infrastructure, to manage our relationships with our neighbors, to bring our interests, hopes, and our people together and show the world how democracy should be. That is your legacy. That is our revolution. What does music sound like in space? You may have noticed, Earth isn't doing too great lately, comrades. Time to find a different planet. Cosmocrats, the people's zero-gravity adventure game, is the only video game that features zero-gravity drone piloting. Of course, space communism, space capitalism, a huge, branching storyline. Narration by beloved character actor Bill Nye. There's not much else to do whilst peeling. Satisfying connections. Artificial intelligence. Natural morons. Vodka. And Bill Nye. Did I say that already? Do you actually know what you're doing? Cos 
Smoke Rats, the Evil Zero Gravity Adventure Game, leaving Earth on November 5th. Wait a minute, it can't end like this. But that, my friends, is but the short beginning of humanity's long journey deeper into space. Hey there, my name's Dune. I'm the creator of Art of Rally. That's my camper van, which about half the game was developed in. So, Art of Rally is a top-down racing game about rally, which is basically driving cars on narrow roads through forests around the world. Just trying to go as fast as you can while making as little mistakes as you can. So here we are in free roam. This is kind of a place where you can practice your skills, do some exploring, um, just basically get used to the car handling. You can also do cool stuff like taking the view. So just see some cool views. So this is kind of like an overview of the cars we have in the game. There's 50 cars. They're all inspired by iconic cars from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And there's that crazy van. So here we are driving a Group B rally car in Sardinia. Good jump. So the controls are in between simulation and arcade, so it does take a bit of real car handling skill to kind of master the handling. So you have to really use the brakes. Um, you can't just be full throttle the whole time when you're starting, at least when you're starting to play this game. So there's like a full replay mode in the game. Um, also there's leaderboards so you can see how you stack up against your friends and against the world. So here we are, driving in Japan. One of my favorite parts of the game is the photo mode. So that basically you can, you can also go into it from replays, so you can set the car exactly where you want to and try to get your perfect shot. So here we are lining up. So there's a full kind of suite of photo effects you can use. <clears throat> Not super, super advanced, but enough to make it so you can do what you want, let's say. So you rely on the shot, quick, and there it is. Thanks for checking the game out. Monster camp gossip? Then I have good news. They say there's this powerful rich camper, yeah? So the other day, not one, not two, but three of her evil exes came to camp looking for her. What happened next? Who was wild? 
Wait, that's not all. Everyone knows there's this cute robot attending monster camp, right? Here's something else, though. I heard there was this robot uprising that threatened to end monster kind. Was our robot friend trying to stop it? Or leading it? We may never know. This is just the start. Monster Camp is riddled with gossip. Wait and see. Monster Prom, be your worst self. Hey there, this is Parker. I'm the media director and audio lead here at Serenity Forge, and I'm glad you could join us for a sneak peek of Date Night Bowling. Date Night Bowling is a casual retro bowling game, but with its own unique spin. You are out at the bowling alley for a dating event, and there's this rich cast of characters there with you, all looking to see if they can hit it off. You can choose who you play as, you can choose who you're out on a date with, and then you and the game AI, or you and a person who's sitting there with you, playing with you locally, can enjoy a fun date night of bowling at one of these two great bowling alleys that each have their own decor and their own soundtrack to really set that special mood for your date. But as with any date, it's not really just about bowling. And so while you're out there with your date and they're applauding you when you get a strike and you're making fun of them when they get a gutter ball, you also have these quirky little mini games where you can really try and make that best first impression. Let's take a look at some of those challenges. Whether it's trying to land the perfect high five and how awkward it can be when you miss, or your date saying, oh, look at the cute penguin in the claw machine, and then it is your life's mission to get that penguin. Or those hidden little guarded moments where you have to clean your teeth to make yourself as presentable as possible for your date, but you can't do it while they're looking. Maybe you try to clean up the table while they're away, but then make them pretty unhappy when you accidentally throw their keys and wallet into the trash. And of course, what's any date without some poorly executed karaoke? So it starts off as just this fun bowling experience that can be fast paced or it can be more relaxed, but then in between frames is when you actually get to have the date and see if you can earn that great rapport with your bowling partner to maybe go out on a date again. And that's what really makes date night bowling such a special and charming experience to play where you can come back over and over again, not just to bowl, but also to try out other combinations of these characters and get better at those challenges to see if you can really hit it off. We're super excited for you to play some date night bowling. It's coming your way early next year. You can wishlist it right now on Steam, and we really hope you enjoy it. Until then, thanks for watching. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Jeopardize. It's five to ten minute mission to explore a strange new world, to level up an incompetent crew and preferably keep them all alive, to boldly go where the little mission marker tells you to go. We all know they don't make engines like they used to. So at some point, you're gonna need to give the old can some TLC. Just do yourself a favor and avoid doing that in the middle of an asteroid belt. Pay attention to that first syllable there and watch yours. It's like the old space crew say, if your crew member takes a hit, they're in the sh Physics 101, Cadet. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. If the gravity is turned off on your ship and your crew is firing off extinguishers with no boots on the ground, what do you think is going to happen? That's right. They'll be flying backwards down the corridor faster than a falcon on a Kessel Run. In space, 
No one can hear you scream. So if you find yourself in a blind panic and purge your ship without checking that your crew are at a safe distance, you won't hear all the abuse they're shouting at you either. Every cloud. Not all crew members are created equal, and most of them only do one thing well. Don't mix up your classes, or you'll get into all sorts of trouble. Allocate accordingly. Now you're starting to see why it's important you don't lose any crew members to asteroids, airlocks, or fire extinguisher-related incidents. Let's pretend for a moment that you haven't paid attention to a single thing I've said. You've lost a few vital crew members. You need to escape before losing any more. You've made use of those shiny new escape pods you had the foresight to install. But when you get back, some of your escaped crew are nowhere to be seen. Before you hire a completely new bunch of recruits with absolutely no experience whatsoever, you might want to go on a rescue mission. They're probably floating around somewhere using their last minutes of life support to imagine all the ways to make your life hell if they ever see you again. But their experience could come in handy in the future. Well, that's about all the advice I've got for you right now. But I'm sure you'll discover plenty more ways to mess everything up over the course of your impending space adventure. It's a dangerous world outside your ship. And with you in charge, it could be an even more dangerous one inside it. And that is looking incredible. I want to give another shout out to Modern Wolf. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, there were so many games in that segment that I really yeah. enjoyed. I'm a big fan of sci-fi, so I actually really had a thing for both Cosmocrats and Space Crew. Um, what, Space, what Crew looks, Space Crew looks look, looks pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I, I love how it's not just serious sci-fi. It's kind of to boldly go where the little blip tells you to go. I, I love that kind of irreverent humor. Yeah, and and also like uh, the the game premieres tomorrow. Right? Yeah, that's out tomorrow. Um, yeah, so, I am so excited about that. So yeah, so definitely it. check that out. Um, Victory Heat Rally is is like one of my favorites, just because it it meshes pixel art with 3D and it looks really fun. Um, also, that is live on Kickstarter now. Shout out to Kickstarter. Shout out to Sky Devil Palm. The game looks amazing. Go support that team. Do you have any other favorites? Um, yeah, actually. So um, I really loved uh, Date Night Bowling as well. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like a really different looking game. It, admittedly, it looks a bit more, you know, a, a bit nicer than most of my dates go. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is but like it, it just looked really sweet and wholesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really All right. So our next guest is also a friend of the mix. Uh, I met her through GameSpot and through her her trailer making. Now she that she is the head of community and marketing at Twitch. Our friend Mary Kish, who will kick off another batch of games. Hey guys and gals, my name is Mary Kish, and I am head of community marketing at Twitch.tv. And I'm thrilled to show you guys a big old grab bag of games that you're probably going to want to get your hands on. I'm always excited to see what's going to be the next big advancement in gaming, whether it's technical innovation or a fantastical world or a unique game design. And with the next gen consoles right around the corner, I think we're going to see a lot more developers taking huge leaps of faith to see what's going to be that next big hit. And when it comes to the streaming world, we're seeing lots of love for massive competitive online playgrounds and interactive experiences with friends and replayability. It's actually been a surprise to see which games have been the top of the charts this year, some of the games that didn't actually even come out this year but had a resurgence. But what they all have in common is that they keep viewers glued to their seats to see what's going to happen next. I'm Sun Wan Shin from Busan Sanai Games. One Hon, A Vengeful Spirit is a paranormal stealth action game about revenge and its price. The main character is a Korean girl who was killed along with her family during an attack on her village. She meets the god of death and makes a deal with him. 
It gives her the power to turn into a ghost and possess living creatures. The central game mechanic is stealth. She doesn't have any armor for protection, and her only weapon is an ability to possess enemies for a short amount of time. Players need to move covertly and plan every step. She can take life force from living creatures, possess them, or turn into a ghost. With no other offensive or defensive ability, the only option is to sneak and hide from the enemies looking for the best opportunity to attack. The high complexity of the game makes players monitor each of their actions closely, since the punishment for being caught is a quick death. The player is always in a losing position. Your opponent will always be stronger and ready to hunt you down. The player can create a lot of ways to complete a mission, balancing between stealth and combat, but you need to be focused and plan your every action, as the penalty for a mistake is severe. The need for constant balance of stealth and action should provide a tense experience for players. The game is set in a fictional version of Korea in the beginning of the 20th century. After being killed, the girl decides to make a deal with Chaseung Saja, the god of death, who promises her a reunion with her family in the afterlife. She helps the spirits of her people to find peace by completing their favors and performing brutal revenge. But everything has its price, and she will have to face the consequences of her actions and restore the balance of life and death. Hi, Chris from the 30XX team here. Today, we're going to talk about the newest way to enjoy 30XX, which we're calling Mega Mode. It's a lower stress way to enjoy a fixed playthrough of the game without permadeath. 30XX is all about playing your way. We want you to enjoy the game however it's fun to you. In Mega Mode, generate a unique dive, tackle the stage of your choice, then spend your nuts on power-ups and plan your next move. In a given dive, each level remains fixed, the same each time. If you die, you'll be sent back to HQ, where you can try the same stage again, or take on a different challenge first. Each time you start a new dive, you'll generate a fresh set of levels that you can tackle in any order. Each level is assigned a difficulty when you start the dive, so you might get an easy clock zone this time, and a really hard one next time. Mega Mode supports all the classic 30XX bells and whistles, including the Memory Index for unlocking permanent upgrades, the Entropy Cluster for turning up the heat before a dive, and full local and online co-op so you can enjoy a dive with a friend. You can even add a new player mid-dive. Mega Mode is perfect for players just getting into 30XX, and it's great for folks who love tackling a given challenge until they're able to master it. We hope you're as excited to get your hands on it as we were to make it. Stay safe, and thanks for watching. Hello, we are XR Studios, and this is our latest game, The Riftbreaker. We are really excited to be a part of the Mix Next showcase this year, and we want to show you something that we've been working on for the past couple of months. We join Ashley as she is looking for new mineral deposits to boost production in her newfound base on Galatia 37. However, she is going to find a little more than she bargained for. There is going to be lots of fighting in the Riftbreaker and some species of creatures are a little more malevolent than others. And here we see a new kind of monster. This one is called Kermon. What makes Kermon especially dangerous is its natural hostility towards all other life forms. They will not only attack Mr. Riggs on sight, but also fight for territory with other species of creatures of Galatia 37. They're not especially tough, but their invisibility cloak makes them a really difficult target to hit. If you allow them to get too close, they will unleash a powerful attack using blades that they have for arms. Creatures such as these poor arachnoids do not pose as much of a threat all of a sudden. The entire planet seems to be determined to make our mission fail, but we must continue. We must look for new minerals, we must look for more energy, in order to open a portal back home. 
the presence of hyper-aggressive, intelligent predators that are also invisible will not make your job any easier. We as a species are really good at solving problems, so you will find ways to make Kermans a little less dangerous. In the meantime, just watch for movement in the grass and lay down mines. Don't get too caught up fighting creatures outside of your base. Remember that your main task is to keep your headquarters alive and your headquarters will come under constant attack from waves and waves of hostile creatures, just like right now. It's good that we can instantly teleport to our headquarters and defend ourselves from these creatures. Building solid defenses and expanding your arsenal with new technologies will give you lots of advantages in long fights. You can always craft new gear using the blueprints you research and the minerals that you find. Making use of all the inventions that you can will guarantee that you will live to fight another day and make it one step closer to coming home. We hope you enjoyed this little video. If you want more, visit us on YouTube. Bye bye. Cut, cut! Roderick, this isn't another one of your cash-grabbing remakes. I need you to be a doctor! To live it, to breathe it, through your face and into your soul! Do you want to be remembered as one of the greats? Do you want to bring home a golden statuette? Do you want to save Two Point County? Well, a great artist once said that art can heal the world. It was me, I said that. These people are sick, Roderick, sick, and the only cure is culture. They need music. They need art. They need your acting! <sighs> All right, are you ready, Roderick? And action! <sighs> Can we get a real doctor in here? Two Point Hospital allows you to manage your own healthcare system, um, which might sound dull, but it isn't really, because our illnesses and ailments are all made up, fun, quirky, weird illnesses, which you have to work out how to cure in equally weird and wonderful ways. So our latest DLC is delving into the world of celebrity, really. We kind of realised that this sort of celebrity theme is something that's become a running theme through through what we've done so far. So it's, it, it was really interesting to sort of think, OK, how can we bring them all together? So Culture Shock kind of leans on some of the celebrities we've already in introduced into Two Point County. So at the start of the DLC, you'll receive a request from artist Zara Fitzpocket. She believes that she's noticed a correlation between the poor health of the people in the county and the poor state of the arts in the county. For your first stop, uh, Zara is going to take you to Plywood Studios, the home of film and television in Two Point County. We've got Roderick Cushion, who's our, you know, wonderful, slightly now B-movie actor. Um, his better films are behind him. Um, and he's trying to relaunch his career with this kind of reality show um, hospital series. The objective of the level is to is to make a hit show, obviously. So part of that will be improving Roderick and training him up to be a five-star doctor. But you'll also need to be taking um, requests from the show's producers. You're trying to sort of encourage Roderick to become more skillful as uh, his character. And his character, he plays um, a, a real life doctor working in a real life uh, hospital, which just happens to be um, a film set as well. Mudbury Festival is Two Point County's old music festival, uh, and you'll be heading there to run hospitality and healthcare. It's kind of like the hospital is the facility for people who go to these festivals. So they come in waves. So as you can imagine, this level has surges of things that go on in between the festivals taking place. And finally, you'll head to Fitzpocket Academy, where Zara is hosting an exhibit to celebrate the health of the arts in Two Point County. This level has uh, a number of paparazzi you have to deal with. You have to be very careful about who gets in and who, who pretends to be ill or who pretends to be celebrities. 
As you'd imagine, the illnesses in the arts district of Two Point County are very on theme. So we've got um, private parts where you'll need to melt down patients that look like toy soldiers. There's stunt trouble where patients have developed a real thirst for danger. And then there's soiled self where, well, the patients have soiled themselves. So Culture Shop will be available October the 20th. And if you pre-purchase, you'll get a 10% discount. So give it a go and I hope you have fun. Hey everyone, we're the developers of Away the Survival Series, an adventure game inspired by nature documentaries where you play as a small sugar glider. Today we'll be showcasing Away's brand new day-night cycle. Right now, dusk is approaching. Soon the sun will set and we'll enter the nighttime world of Away. As nighttime settles in, nocturnal creatures come out, so we'll have to be careful. Right now we're trying to find a blue mushroom to eat. But as you can see, there's quite a few rats down below that we're going to want to avoid. We could try facing them head on, but there's probably too many for us to handle. So let's go with a more stealthy approach. We can hide in this tall grass to avoid attracting attention. Try to stay under cover, and don't walk straight into one of those rats. Thankfully, we can keep an eye on predators using the sugar glider's finely tuned instinct. Just keep an eye on our instinct meter. Once it runs out, we won't be able to tap into the sugar glider's enhanced senses until we've had a chance to rest a bit. I feel like we're getting a bit closer, but we're not quite there yet. Let's let's not get complacent. <laughs> and see, just as I say that, there's a rat right in front of us. <laughs> but there's a mushroom, so all's well that ends well. As the night wears on, we've been exploring the forest a bit more, but some areas are more dangerous than others. Looks like we've just ventured into spider territory. Oh no! They've already spotted us, so stealth isn't an option. Looks like we're going to have to fight our way out of this one. We're a bit outnumbered here. There's no way we can take them all down at once. Let's head up to the trees so we can funnel them onto one branch. It'll probably be a bit easier for us to handle this way. That's a good strategy. We'll have to keep our footing on these branches, but at least the spiders can only swarm from one direction. And they have a lot further to fall. <laughs> yeah, honestly, swatting spiders off of tree branches is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> now, some of the predators in a way are just too big to fight, so we're gonna have to take to the trees to avoid them altogether. Thankfully, the sugar glider is an arboreal creature, so it's right at home in the branches. Ugh, that fox looks hungry. As soon as we touch the ground, it's bound to catch us. Now we could climb on any branch we want, but we have to be strategic and carefully plan where we want to go next. One wrong move could mean that we'll be a fox's midnight snack. As the sun rises again, it's time to continue our journey through away. But we're not out of the woods yet. The daytime has its own dangers to contend with. Thanks for watching our gameplay reveal. Come chat with us and let us know what you think on our Discord. Hey everyone, this is Julian from HeadUp, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about our first self-developed and self-published game, which is called Tinkertown and is a multiplayer sandbox adventure game. Tinkertown is about exploring, crafting and building. And each time you start a new game, a unique world will be randomly generated. And you can go on and play it either by yourself or with up to three friends online. While progressing in the game, you will gather new resources, unlock new blueprints and crafting recipes. And ultimately, you will build your own little village by setting up buildings, workshops and furniture. And this way, a small village can rise from an initial hit in no time. You'll be able to discover and expand into uncharted territory by exploring beautiful landscapes, such as mystical forests, great deserts, chilling ice tundras, and steaming lava mountains. And of course, during the progress of the game, even more. You might even find interesting characters in the world that will move into your township and help you with new recipes, buffs, and secrets. While exploring, you will find entrances 
to mysterious dungeons that are scattered around the world. And there you can descend into combat-driven action and battle large underworld bosses. And of course, if there's risk, there'll be more rewards. So there's epic loot that awaits those who dare to face the underworld. Tinkertown will hit Steam Early Access in Fall 2020, where it will receive its final touches with the help of you, the community. So join our Discord, Twitter and Wishlist Tinkertown on Steam to stay updated about upcoming better tests and more. Rated everyone. Welcome back to The Mix Next. I once didn't pay my taxes for three years. That's that that's um, upsetting. But we got to turn up. That, that one's hilarious. There were some amazing games in that portion. Um, I love 30XX. I love Mega Man games. So that one, you know what I mean, uh, just floats my boat. Yeah, for me, it was all about Two Point Hospital. It's been one of my favorite games during this whole pandemic. Something about playing in playing a game about a hospital full of sick people during a pandemic for some reason I find <laughs> really fun. So I'm really excited about this new expansion pack and I'm a big fan of modern art so I really liked the shout out to Damien Hurst with the whole shark and a fish tank thing. Oh wow. They had yeah shout game. out to Sega for for uh, working with us on that. That's that game. I got it. I haven't tried it yet but I need to play it for sure. Yeah I also really liked Away with the sugar gliders and uh Eating mushrooms, you know, that, that's something I really enjoy. Mushroom <laughs> that's, mushrooms, not, not like not the special magic mushrooms. Ones. But <laughs> so, you know, it's really nice to see that simulated in a cute game like that. Yeah, Tinkertown looks really fun. I, I want to pick that one up immediately. I just like that the 2D art style um, and the how they meshed it with 3D again. I love aesthetics in games, so that really, um, that was dope. Yeah, that was really beautifully done. Well, next up we have, uh, we're going to show off a whole bunch of games from White Fawn Digital. Um, their thing is kind of, uh, kind of wholesome, cute, very experiential games. So um, I've been really looking forward to a lot of their titles. And um, yeah, so check them out momentarily, but stick around because we also have a special guest. Yeah, so, you'll, you'll yeah. love that one for yeah. sure. Cool. Check Let's it check out. it out. Samantha, the community manager for White Thorn Games. We're an indie publisher based in Erie, PA. Every publisher has a certain style, and we're no different. The kinds of games we tend to make are approachable, bite-sized, stress-free experiences that you can enjoy for as little or as long as you'd like. These kinds of games have all kinds of names. And there's not one single unifying genre. We've heard approachable, cozy, wholesome, casual, and more. And we're happy with any or all of these titles. They're the kinds of games that are hard to name, but you know the moment you're playing one. We grew up playing games like Pokemon, Harvest Moon, Animal Crossing, Tamagotchi, and Cookie Mama. And we're still big fans of games like Stardew Valley, My Time at Portia, Ooblets, and Spirit Fair. 
Today we're going to take a few minutes to check out footage from four of our titles. We hope you'll stick around. It's September 1st, 1986. You take on the role of 40-something Meredith Weiss, who returns from the big city to her quiet hometown. As Meredith, you get to decide who to talk to, who to befriend, and perhaps even start a romantic relationship with. Play late and escape to a beautiful, rustic environment without cell phones and the internet. Drive around the lake in your dad's trusty mail truck, or let the autopilot do the work. Talk to a range of engaging characters, each with their own personalities and quirks. Choose after work activities, hang out with your friends, help out your neighbors, or stay home and read a book. Experience two in-game weeks of branching story that doesn't shy away from slice of life themes. Determine your own story. There are no right or wrong answers or endings, simply what you want to happen. is a day in the life community sim game where you are given an important and adorable task. Rebuild the town's cat cafe and fill it with cute and cuddly creatures. You will journey to a small village filled with magical girls and other fantastical friends where you are placed in charge of a rundown cat cafe. Build up your cafe by filling it with cute furniture, fun decorations, yummy pastries, and get it bustling with animals again. Calico is meant to make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. The gameplay reflects that with a laid-back, low-stress, creative environment to explore and play in. The player will encounter many animals in the world of Calico. Once befriended, you can name them, add them to your party, or send them to their new home in the cafe. Your task in Calico is to bring the town's cafe back to life again. Princess Farmer was just an ordinary farmer when one day she woke up under the Gaia tree. Now through the magic of Mother Gaia, she can hoist up whole rows of veggies with ease to make matches and smash obstacles by herself, in co-op, or even versus a friend. Play through this charming story meets match three, meeting adorable characters and creatures along the way. It may look like Princess Farmer plays like a modern match three game, but it's much more strategic and reaction based, tasking you with character movement and stack management. You can choose to adjust how you approach your strategy to maximize matches, combos, and smashes. But watch out for storms! That's when grumpy blocks show up to spoil all your harvesting fun! Something mysterious is happening in the woods, and it's your job to puzzle your way to uncover it. You'll learn about the world around you as you talk and build relationships with the lovable characters, including Mother Gaia, Garlic, Shopkeeper Rowan, and even Bot Bunny. Smash rocks, make combos, win hearts. is a narrative-driven adventure game with a focus on exploration and non-linear progression. You play as Teacup, a shy and introverted young frog who loves drinking tea and reading. The day before she is to host a tea party at her house, she realizes she's completely out of tea and thus must venture into the woods around her to find the herbs she needs to restock her pantry. Unlike other adventure games, Gameplay in Teacup is not about gathering items to solve obtuse puzzles. To advance, the player must interact with the world and talk with its characters. During her expedition, Teacup will also encounter a variety of charming minigames, ranging from simple puzzles to action-based challenges. 
Ultimately, Teacup aims to tell a story about the nice things that can happen and the friendly people you can meet when you dare venture out of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, I can do it. Oh my god, it's future. Future is coming. Yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Come on, come, come. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait, wait. I can do it. I can do it. Come. Stay, stay. Okay, go, go. Yeah. Hey. Psst, 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 psst. No. No. Come on, come on. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, oh my god. It's future. Future is. So incredible. <sighs> Run, one, go. You die. Hello everyone, I'm Charles from Charge Games and today I'm gonna show you the game we're working on which is called Overloop. It's a dystopian adventure game about cloning, it's coming in 2021 and it's published by Digirally. So let's get right into it. We are here in one of the very first levels of the game and we are accompanied by Dennis, a friendly AI who will comment on our actions throughout the level. He was abandoned in this testing facility and is super happy to talk to someone. For this test, we are given a gun, a cloning gun to be more precise. So we grab it and we proceed to the very first test chamber. Here Dennis reminds us that our clones are like us, they have a soul. But hey, I won't jump over this laser by myself. And this is the heart of the gaming experience offered by Overloop. You have to sacrifice a lot of clones in many different ways to progress and prevent the bad guy from sacrificing lots of clones. It's a pretty open-ended way of making fun of all those games in which, under the pretext of saving someone, we end up killing hundreds of people. But this time, you also control the victims. Here you see that because we are limited with the number of clones we can have, we can't reach the end of this room. But that's okay, clones have a very convenient suicide option. 
In this room, you can see another very important mechanic from our game. Not only you can jump on top of each other's, but you can also walk while carrying some of your characters. Ok, just one last example. Here, I want to reach the platform at the top right, but a laser is blocking the way. So, I'm gonna activate the elevator with my original character to send one of my clones to deactivate the laser. And then, I'll use another clone to activate the elevator again once the way is clear. Obviously, the puzzles will become more and more complex and diversify over the course of your adventure. The game offers so many fun ways to kill clones. Oh by the way, at the end of this level, you get the ability to create an additional clone. You can use this new clone to exit the room. And as you can see, this door needs 3 people to open. So we're gonna use all of our clones and then end the level. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. You can wishlist the game on Steam if you liked it. And we're super impatient to show you the final game when it releases next year. Bye! Hi everyone, this is Cyril from the Arcade Crew, and today I'm going to show you some features from the upcoming CCCP tactical RPG, The Last Spell. In this game, the apocalypse happened. Some mages triggered the end of the world by accident, and now pretty much all living things have been wiped out. There's one last city standing, but it's mostly ruins. Your role is to defend it, as well as the mages, so they can cast one spell that might utter destruction, the last spell. First, a production phase in which you can make some buildings like houses, an armor maker, a mana well, a temple and many more. But also gain new levels, buy new gear for your heroes, heal them and even recruit new characters. Then, you have the deployment phase. During this one, you can build some defenses, walls, watchtowers, catapults, and place your heroes as they wait for the battle. Finally, you have the main phase of the game, the combat phase. Every night, hordes of enemies will come to your city, and you need to kill them all before they reach your town and attack your mage. We have what we call Asymmetric gameplay. You only have a handful of very, very strong heroes fighting hundreds of weak enemies. We're putting a big focus on the optimization of the damage you will be dealing every turn, thanks to many AoE skills. In the last spell, the characters are classless. This means that all the skills you'll be able to use depend on the weapons your character will be carrying. We want to give the player this arcade feeling. Turns are quick to play and you will easily use impressive skills to slay dozens of enemies. However, the player will be challenged with the resources optimization and the synergies between the characters they'll need to find. 
if they hope to make some progress in the game. So you'll need to start over many times to try new strategies. Finally, at the end of every night, you'll see this screen showing your score, the panic bar and the damn souls you managed to collect. In the last spell, you have to take care of your citizen. If no enemy manages to penetrate the city walls, your panic bar will stay low and you will gain more rewards. You also earn souls when killing enemies, they will enable you to unlock new things for your next runs. And this ends this very small presentation of the last spell. We're still working on the game and we have long months of development ahead of us. But feel free to wishes the game on Steam to support us and join the CCCP community on Discord. Hey everyone, Zax here. Today I'll be showcasing the game that I've been working on for a while by the name of Tiny Shot, which is an arcade uh, side scroller shooter. Uh, it also has some uh, roguelike elements to it. Welcome to the Black Forest, the first level of Tiny Shot, and actually one of my favorite levels. The game control is pretty simple uh, you use both sticks to move and aim. Uh, RT and LT to shoot or dash and the LB uh, and the LT to throw bombs and also use your grapple hook. Or you can purchase items from this statue over here. Uh, oh, he just killed me. <laughs> you can purchase items from the statue over here uh, or you can wait till like the wave is over because some chests will spawn and you can try your luck with them. I'm taking one. Okay, that's a good item. Now everything I get will be doubled uh, when it comes to souls Let's get these ones up as well and here we go after you finish each wave you'll be able to go to the market or skip to the next wave i'm going to the market because i would like to purchase a new weapon or so okay so this is a force guider it's a it's a really fun boss to fight uh, he has a one tricky move where he, punch, he punches you and you need to like really look at the telegraph very quick to be able to avoid it. But for the rest, you should be fine. It's actually really fun how I came up with the idea of this boss. I was in uh, the math class and I was like not paying enough attention to the teacher. I was like just doodling around and I just drew a tree and then all of a sudden it had arms. And I was like, yeah, when I go home, I'm going to implement that. And here, here he is. <laughs> Almost died there. And he's dead. By opening this chest, uh, if the next level was unlocked, you'll get a pet, which I just got because I unlocked the next level already. If you didn't have the next level unlocked, you'll be able to... Get a new skin, get some, unlock some new weapons. I better be careful. There's so many monsters and I only have life. And he killed me. <laughs> this fight basically. Uh, if tiny feet, you'll start a new run. Uh, we can go to the main menu. Yeah, that, that's tiny shot for you. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching this video. And I can't wait till the game is actually released. Uh, don't forget to wishlist it on Steam if you want. It's uh, just called tiny shot. This, 
the freedom you want! Do you believe in salvation? Congratulations! We are delighted to inform you that your application to the Dungeons Company has been accepted. Welcome to the world of the Dungeon Masters. Legend of Keepers is an original mix of dungeon management and roguelike, sprinkled with offbeat humor. In this game, you play as the bad guys. You manage your dungeon like a company and send your employees, monsters, to kill the heroes who tried to take your treasure. Join the Dungeons Company and climb the corporate ladder. Hire more and more powerful monsters and level them up. Unlock new traps, try new strategies. Ruthlessly kill groups of heroes and collect their blood. Or scare them away in terror and collect their tears. Who said gold was the only currency? Manage the strikes of your employees and take care of them, because if their motivation reaches zero, they will burn out. Plunder, slaughter, trade, bewitch. Go to the therapist and prepare for the most surprising events. In Legend of Keepers, every game is different, but after each defeat, you will keep your master's bonuses. Choose to play as Mog, the centaur, with his hordes of monsters and mini-bosses. Sorel, the dryad enchantress, with her customizable spells and improvement tree. Subject 9001, the monkey engineer, with her mechanical monsters and her fearsome inventions. To each master, their strategy, their range of monsters, their powers, and dungeons. Make wise decisions and fight well. Hi, my name is David Prinsmill and I'm the game designer on U Socket Parking. We wanted to make a game that was easy to pick up and be instant fun when jumping in. Being a fan of old toy car racing games like Micro Machines and inspired by games like What the Golf. I wonder what it would be like to mix those two up, and that's how Socket was born. I'm a Socket spots. Oh, and by the way, take shorts is absolutely hurried. This is not your typical racing game. There's a catch. Stopping your car means parking your car. There is no reverse people, only one shot for parking glory. Don't worry, you got an infinite number of cars at your disposal. If you're not satisfied with your run so far, you can just respawn a new car, and another one, and another one, and another one, and so on. By adding this mechanic, I wanted the player to never have a dull moment and keep the action going the whole time. The game might seem cute and forgiving, judging by its visual. Levels will definitely get insane as you progress and further develop your parking skills. The most fun part of this game and working on it is of course the physics. We've invented a lot of physics-based tools and obstacles for you to master, but also hilariously fail at. Here are a couple to get the feel of the madness. The speed boost, the jump pad, magnets, mines, teleporters, devilish NPCs, and many more to come. I've always enjoyed level editors. They gave me ways to express my creativity in my favorite games. That's exactly why we've included one in U Socket Parking. We want our community to surprise us with crazy and original levels. We're giving you the same means of creating a level as us. The level editor included is the exact same one that we used to create our levels in the single player campaign. So go ahead and give us and the community many more ways to suck at parking by showing your to prove us wrong.
Uh, hey everyone, I'm Nick Sutner. I used to sign indie games for PlayStation and Oculus. And these days I'm an independent writer, designer, and consultant working on games like Carto, which you're going to see in the showcase today. Uh, I also work part-time for Panic, who published Untitled Goose Game and the upcoming Nor Play With Your Food, which is also uh, in the showcase today as well. Uh, and thinking about the theme of what's next in games, it's hard not to think about the next generation of console hardware that's launching soon, of course. Uh, but that really makes me reflect on the current consoles, where within a single generation, indie games and independent developers became a critical part of the ecosystem and messaging across every platform. And indie games have provided so much of the variety, the heart, the creativity, uh, and the maturity of games over the past decade that it's really hard to picture uh, what the landscape would look like without us. And it's a great time to be making weird, ambitious, and personal games. I think that the audience has really expanded. There's a huge contention of people out there looking for something different. And this year has been such an important time to reflect on what games can represent within our lives and the kind of games that we spend our time with. And if you look at the games in the showcase today, uh, you know, the breadth of art styles, the genres, the teams, it's awesome to see. And that's really, to me, what a new generation is about, uh, new ideas and experiences and using the excitement and momentum of a new audience to find support for those ideas. It's not always about taking advantage of more powerful hardware. It can be about taking advantage of a moment in time when the uh, culture of games feels reinvigorated. So I'm going to go play some more Splunky 2, but enjoy the rest of the showcase. And we're back. We have to thank our guests, uh, Nick Sutner and Sweary, for hopping on and supporting the mix over the years. Um, I met Nick when he was at PlayStation, which was crazy, and he supported the mix when we were just having our live events, when we could have live events, of course. Um, and then he was at Oculus, and now he's doing his thing as a uh, you know a creative. Uh, you know, person in the industry now, which is, it's great to see that transition. And that sweary video had me dying. <laughs> that was classic sweary. I just, future's coming. Yeah, dude is, dude is hilarious. We were like, yo, sweary, can you do something for the stream? And he was like, Sure, but, but we I, had no idea. What we had expect. no idea, and that was just straight gorgeous. Uh, which of those games did you like, Justin? I, I must say, I'm a big fan of Calico. I am all about cats, so a game in which you can wear a cat on your head as you build up a cat cafe, totally my jam. Yeah, what, I mean, I'm I'm it? really I really like uh, Calico as well. That one that one definitely stood out. What which ones were the the standouts for you? Um, so besides Calico, I also really liked Orbital Bullet. I I don't know, such a simple idea, yet I've never seen anything like that before. And I don't know how to describe it, just round? It's like a round shooter? Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, when, yeah. you, when you have these type of, like, you know, pixel um, art games, trying to figure out a new concept, it, it's uh, it, it's not that easy. So, com like, looking at that concept, I was like, wow, immediately. Like, you have to dodge the bullets, and then the bosses come out. It's, it's really interesting. We want to thank our sponsors again, because without you know, our sponsors, we could not make this happen. We also want to thank, Wil Wil thank Wilmer Sound uh, for giving us this beautiful space, AV Society and the mix team for sure. Yeah, so next up, uh, Justin actually had a chance to speak to Alex from Tiny Build earlier this week. So we'll get to show you that um, interview and then we'll cut into some more games. Yes. What's happening, Alex? Thank you so much for joining us on the mix next. Uh, it, we definitely love to see what Tiny Build is always cooking and appreciate the support that you have for this particular stream and also the other events that we've had in the past that you guys have worked with us on. So I got one quick uh, first question, which is why the name Tiny Build? You guys are busting out huge builds right now, so it may be irrelevant. But why the name? <laughs> well, it's actually been a running joke that, um, you know, when we have like a 50 by 50 booth at PAX, that's like, you know, 50 feet high or something, um, that uh, the name Tiny Build doesn't really resonate. But um, I think um, when we started the company, uh, we were like, okay, we have this first game called No Time to Explain, right? And we're like, oh, we actually need a studio name. So uh, me and Tom just sat there and just came up with the name Tiny Belt at the spot. We're like, okay, we're a small team, we're building stuff, right? And it's actually funny because um, what I didn't know is uh, that the word Tiny Belt in British slang uh, can mean like a, a person that is skinny, 
right? Um, so uh, Tom knew that uh, that was, uh, you know, like the definition of tiny build. So he was like, okay, let's go with tiny build. While in my mind, I was actually refer referencing, um, there's this build up style in um, uh, Warcraft 3 called tiny build. So we're kind of like, you know, under this assumption that, hey, you know that this was a Warcraft D thing. He's like, no, you know that this just basically means that, you know, like a tiny build, you know, like person was a small build. Um, for about five years, we, we had that assumption, and then we're like, oh, okay, this is awkward. Yeah, that's where uh, the word tiny build came from. We just basically came up with it on the spot, and, and we just kind of rolled with it. From coffin installations at PAX to your success with the Hello Neighbor series, where is tiny build going next? And how do you think game development will evolve and the experiences in games will evolve in the next generation? Oof. That's uh, that's a really, really interesting question. I could talk about that for probably hours. Um, I think uh, what we did with Hello Neighbor is uh, we had this hypothesis that um, eventually the uh, games industry, especially the indie scene, is going to consolidate into um, essentially franchises where uh, teams unite with each other. Um, and if one of them has like, you know, a, a runaway success, a runaway IP or franchise, then multiple studios will be working on multiple projects at once at the same time. And this is exactly what happened with Hello Neighbor, because right now we have at least three studios working on games for uh, the Hello Neighbor franchise and an auxiliary animation studio that is helping do all of our um, amazing promotions. We have a great lineup of Tiny Build games on the mix next. Tell us about each of the titles, why you chose to publish them, and when they are getting released. All of these games, there is a lot of exciting stuff. So Hello Neighbor 2 is a sequel to our original 2017 uh, runaway hit called Hello Neighbor. And what we want to do with the sequel is completely reinvent the AI. And that's what we've been working on, well, for actually the team has been working on this for close to two years now, where um, the AI would have different behaviors for, uh, for when you're busting into his house and he would chase you around an open world. It's terrifying and I'm really excited to have everyone play it. Now, Black Skylands is actually a very interesting case because um, I have seen the prototype like really, really early on, way back, like actually close to two years ago now, uh, of a solo game developer. And we have decided to partner up with a solo game developer and help him scale a team to up to 15 people, I think it is right now, it might be 16 already, to develop this open world epic adventure of Black Skylands, where you are in an open world of floating islands, you have your base hub, right? You have your ship, you have a goal that gets set up in the very beginning of the game, and you make your way to that goal. The gameplay is spliced up between exploration, uh, shooting with really great combat, and you use like your grappling hook to uh, when you get knocked off uh, of uh, these um, flying platforms. So it's flying ships, open world, gorgeous, gorgeous 2.5D pixel art, an amazing story, and really, really tight controls and gameplay on the combat. Now, Mayhem and Single Valley. Um, this has been in development for quite a long time. Um, so the game's premise uh, could be described the best way is it's Stranger Things meets Zelda. So the premise is that you're about to take off to college, your family is not in its best place, so you feel kind of bad about leaving, um, and you're, yet you're excited and terrified about t hopping on the plane and going off to college. And at the same time, there is uh, a really bizarre uh, chemical spill that happens in the city, and there are radioactive squirrels now. So I guess you're staying and you're figuring out what the hell is going on. Ramen is an 8-player competitive shooter with soup. I'll just let that uh, sink in a little bit. Uh, there are a couple of gameplay elements. Uh, one uh, most notable visual one is that you actually use soup to kind of slide around like in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And then you have a whole bunch of different game modes where you compete for being the, uh, you know, the Sultan of Soup or uh, the Broth King um, with um, what exactly the final game is going to shape up. Well, actually, Mix Next is going to help us uh, a lot in figuring that out. Because right now we have uh, many different ideas that are, you know, like converging together. Uh, my most notable favorite one is a duck turret, 
so there is an untitled duck turret which um, yeah good um, so that turret is something that you set up for area control then you have a whole new mechanic that uh, no one has seen before with uh, fortnite style walls where you just like you know you put up biscuit walls uh, that you used for area control as well and then a whole new um, series of weapons like the brattling gun and uh, different game modes where you uh, like there is a meatball mode where you control a giant meatball and try to score it into the goal. Uh, it's a lot of fun, it's definitely not Rock League whatsoever. And Undungeon is actually a game that I'm really excited about because uh, it has been in development for a few years now with a lot of reworking and um, I think um, the challenge with Undungeon has always been that uh, we had the visuals done really really early on, like the game looks amazing, yet the gameplay was something of a really long iterative process. So with a mixed next demo, uh, we're uh, hoping that people are going to, that are following the project, are going to see the progress that we have made in between the builds that we're releasing. Because like I said, earlier we are really really into releasing builds early and getting a lot of feedback until we get it just right thank you so much alex for hopping on and chatting about the history and the future of tiny build showcasing great games with us we appreciate the support for this stream and the other events uh that we've partnered on Ooh, we can't wait to see what's going to happen next for the Orange Crush, the Orange Squadron, Tiny Build. Thanks everyone for joining us at the Mix Next. I'm really excited to be here and have a great show. And thank you. We are back. Thank you to Tiny Build for that fantastic segment of games. Um, I'm really looking forward especially to Roman. I yeah, ramen, ramen looks amazing. I also love my hand movements. I look like I was about to rap in that in that situation. <laughs> but yeah, there's some games that stood out from Tiny Build. We appreciate them so much for sharing their yeah. games. And, and like Alex's um, just commentary on where things are going next, he's, he's just dope in that space. Yeah, Tiny Build is one of my favorite indie publishers. I especially love the look of Undungeon as well. My little gothic heart just really loves that aesthetic. Um, next up, we have Noor. Uh, the food game that everyone's been talking about in the indie world lately, including an interview that Justin conducted with TJ Hughes, their developer, earlier this week. Yes, and but first, I want to introduce my friend Sean Alexander Allen. He's uh, an incredible indie developer um, and an inspiration in the gaming space. You know, he works with game devs of color. He's really pushing for diversity, and he's amazing. So let's let's move to that. Peace. I'm Sean Alexander Allen, lead designer on the recently released game Treachery Beatdown City, as well as a co-organizer of the Game Does of Color Expo. I've been working adjacent to games for over 20 years, and it's been pretty wild to be so close to games over that time. When you look at the modern games in landscape, you can see so many different types of games, from text adventures to massive 3D infinite world explorations and a great deal of variety in between. We're at a point where developers can do whatever they can imagine in a game, but I wish that imagination involved uh, black culture more often than not. It's as we've seen that it's uh, black people are basically one to two percent of the games industry and I want to see black culture basically everywhere in games, from the creators making them, to the characters, music, and themes expressed in them. We've seen time and time again in music, movies, and basically every art form where this comes to light for a moment and is gone usually all too quickly within a few years, but the impact is basically like super important to everybody. The art moves forward and you start to see it coming back here and there. And for me, that's what I want for the future. Thank you. What are the colors? The visual stimuli that make you hungry? Is it merely a color? Maybe it can be anything. Anything that reminds you of a flavor smell, or a memory. Or 
over this together. What is happening, TJ? Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the mix next. Nor looks incredible. I've been following it for some time now, and I, it, it just seems to be evolving exquisitely. Thanks for having me. Uh, super glad you've been following the project for so long. It's going through so many, so many changes, uh, and I just hope that you're hyped for what's about to come out. So Nor is going to drop when the PlayStation 5 launches. Um, I played it for the first time during Day of the Devs a few years back. What do fans uh, have to look forward to in this latest version of the game? Yeah, I think what folks can come to expect from the new, uh, like, latest and greatest version of Noor is um, just a lot more of the spirit of the game that you've seen in these, like, early demos and in all these GIFs and videos of it circulating around Twitter. Um, I, I really think that even while working with such a prestigious publisher, uh, they've really helped me to keep the spirit of the game, like, in there, where it still feels very, like, um, I don't know, just like out of the mind of a, like a single creator and just like really experimental and really just weird. And so you, you'll see a lot of the quirkiness in the final version of the game, just plus a whole new level of polish, features. Um, we got like kitchen tools and things like that um, that we can't wait to show off. We have uh, an interactive soundtrack. Like there's so many things that just add this extra layer to the game that like were things that I, I wouldn't have even expected to like bring the game to the level that it's at. So real excited about that. <laughs> so TJ, you're, you're definitely an artist at heart and uh, it really comes across strongly in the game. What made you want to jump into the world of game development and how has it treated you or how have you liked or enjoyed the experience so far? It's interesting. Uh, video games have always felt like the go-to medium for me. I don't really know why, um, but just I've always been drawn to uh, anything digital, but at the same time, uh, it's like my mom was an artist, uh, my dad um, was a jazz musician and also um, did things in tech, just like kind of uh, as a hobbyist and th just those influences kind of manifested themselves went within me um, and led to me just like wanting to make video games and ever since being a kid just uh, like telling people like yeah I want to design video games but not knowing what all went into that and so I'm just really glad that uh, I could get to the point where and also technology is at a place where like you can just teach yourself how to do such a thing um, and yeah, just what my ideas translate to 3D super well. It translates to digital. Like, I love pen and paper, but there's just some things that um, my, my brain has always wanted to express, but that you can't quite do with, uh, with pen and paper. And so, yeah, there's just so many things that uh, digital allows you to do that um, are really just it's like so imaginative it's like dreaming out into a phys like an actual tangible experience and so uh, i think that's one of the strengths of games um but if you were to say my favorite part of games um i would say it's the people um i don't know just like have you met an indie developer before because like they're the nicest people on the planet and they've uh just helped me get so far just out of sheer kindness like so many people have just helped me out along my uh game development journey so yeah just super happy about that uh, yeah, love games. Okay, okay, so if I were a type of food, I would be a nice fluffy stack of waffles, squared off waffles with warm or hot Canadian maple syrup uh, poured in each one of the squares. If you were a type of food, what would you be and why? Now there's a question. I believe I am a soup. I've been described before as a soup. Which one? I don't know. Maybe I'm a broccoli cheddar bread bowl. Because, I mean, I would love to put, <laughs> I would love to figure out why I think I am a broccoli cheddar bread bowl. But honestly, you tell me, tweet at me. Tweet at me what you, why you think I'm a soup. So what you've done with Noor is very innovative in the space. From the rendering and shading techniques to the food physics and the music. When you play the game, it really takes you somewhere special. Where do you think games are going and where do you think they're going next? Uh, I think games are going in a direction where they're gonna start getting 
really weird and abstract before they're they kind of like double back and start to be normal again and i think once it hits that point that's when uh games are going to be just kind of generally respected as art um it, it's really interesting right now like in the space of games i feel like anything that's really out there and is really kind of like a personal sentiment or something i don't know it's kind of written off as just like oh yeah this is a tech demo or something or like oh this is just another indie game or something where it's just when it's just like um these games are very valid expressions of just um i don't know like the different sentiments of the developers that make them and whereas before i feel like so many people and so many companies would have to like so many things would go into a game that like one person's identity is kind of erased and i think games are going to, in a direction where we can really just kind of put our personal signatures on them and so i think once that kind of becomes more normalized we're going to see a lot of really weird interesting games and uh it, it's going to be cool i i think it's going to be a very positive thing that's going to push the medium like super super far so looking forward to that <laughs> Once again, thank you so much, TJ, for joining us and sharing your smorgasbord of a game, Nor. Um, we can't wait to pick it up on PS5. Congratulations on everything you do. We look forward to checking out your next artistic journey as well with Terrifying Jellyfish. Peace. I appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for having me on. Um, it's 100% my goal to make art that feels like me and that feels like it comes from the heart. Um, so I really appreciate the support and having me on the show. Um, if you want to follow along, um, you can go to food.game for more about Noor, and you can go to terrifyingjellyfish.com. You can find all my art there. Um, I just post stuff there, works in progress, like finished stuff, commissions, just all that stuff goes there. So yeah, thanks again. Hi, my name is Erdain Weisbrot, and I'm the director of Grime, a side-scrolling action-adventure set in a surreal world obsessed with human-like proportions, where you play as a humanoid black hole. In this video, we're going to be taking a quick look at an alpha build of the game, checking out the combat, a bit of our creature-based progression system, and some of the other features you can expect in the full game. Combat is centered around attacking and dodging, as well as making clever use of weapon special abilities such as the mole side. In addition, I can also absorb enemies. This will not only deal damage, but grant me breath which can be used for healing, as well as make progress towards unlocking a unique trait. These traits can be leveled up at checkpoints and allow me to customize my playstyle. As powerful as absorb may initially seem, not all enemies can be immediately absorbed. Some have segments of their health protected and must be broken through first. This can be achieved using any one of the many weapons in Grime, each having its own unique special attack. For example, if I find the right timing, I can use the Jaw Axe's ability to bite right through an enemy health bar. The Absorb ability is very versatile. It can be used to return projectiles, and even affect enemies with protected health bars or shields, sometimes in surprising but beneficial ways. Not all creatures will react the same, so make sure you learn and adapt, pick the right weapons, and decide when to absorb. As you progress through the game, new enemies will constantly challenge you in different ways, and by defeating bosses and consuming their remains, you will unlock abilities such as pull, which can be used for traversal, but also in combat, pulling traps onto enemies, and sometimes even the enemies themselves. There is a lot more to grab than this including a fully interconnected, seamless world to explore, platforming challenges to overcome, 
secrets to find, and encounter the strange inhabitants of the world, piecing together the truth behind their existence. Grime will launch in 2021. If you like what you saw, you can wishlist us on Steam and follow our social media for the latest development updates. That's all for now, and thank you so much for watching. Hey everyone, this is Feud Wild West Tactics, a turn-based tactics game set in the Wild West. Uh, we were released it recently, a couple of months back, and have a massive content patch called Unlimited Frontier coming, uh, which has a bunch of new features, including over uh, 3,000 new maps and uh, a special new mode that goes in our skirmish mode called Survival, which we're going to show off today. So with Survival, you get to pick your team of characters and basically see how long you can last. There's three different difficulty menu levels leaderboards and uh, and more and we're just going to jump right in and have a look at it now as usual your teams that you pick you know you get to can really kind of design how you want to what you want to bring to the party you know uh, our posse here are some long range guys some short range guys and a melee character called Rita who's pretty vicious uh, if you've played the game uh, this is coming out very soon we're looking to do it within the next month uh, and it's well along and what you're seeing here also is one of the randomized levels. This has both uh, randomized and hand, hand created bits that are combined to make it uh, a more interesting uh, level basically. And this has allowed us to add over 3,000 levels to the game's existing 120 levels. So it really brought, broadens it out a ton. Um, and as you can see, if you haven't seen Feud before, we're kind of moving our guys around. It's all turn-based. Uh, they have a bunch of different abilities they can use. These are all hero characters. We also have hired guns that you can name. Uh, you know, they all have different attacks and quirks and, and perks and things like that. Um, we also have a massive saga mode, which is kind of like a 4X strategy mode uh, that is a lot of fun to play. And all these randomized maps work in strategy, skirmish, survival. We have a story mode as well with some linear stories to help you learn the characters. Um, it's it's really quite a quite a bit of fun. Uh, we're adding more stuff to the saga mode as well. We have some resource that we're adding, uh, so you can uh, set guys to defend some of the resources you capture, and uh, a ton of, a ton more stuff. Really, it's just it's just been a lot of features going in uh, over the last month or so since we got to launch. Uh, we were really able to sit down and see what comes next and that's where limited frontier came from a lot of our favorite ideas uh that didn't quite make launch but we, we knew we could do and we really wanted to get out to players uh soon what we want to do here is just give everyone a glimpse of what's coming so if you want to check out feud we're up on steam right now uh the game is feud wild west tactics and this content patch is completely free uh like i said over 3,000 levels uh new play modes new things for saga mode and a few other features that we haven't even announced yet. So uh, we hope to see everybody there and uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Benjamin Kiefer, or otherwise known as Benston, and I'm the lead developer behind Revita. Revita is a fast paced roguelike platformer in which you step into the footsteps of a young unknown child. After waking up in a metro, having lost all of their memories, not knowing who or where they are, they're led to a floating clock tower. Overcome by a feeling of familiarity, they're sure they'll find some answers at the top. But climbing the tower won't be easy. In an attempt to keep unwanted invaders out, the ever-shifting tower will create an ever-increasing amount of fully procedurally generated rooms filled to the brim with monsters. As you'd expect, the challenge is not entirely hopeless. One of the more interesting mechanics in Revita is that once you defeat an enemy, they will release their soul. Quickly grab it before it vanishes and once enough have been collected, you can use them to regain some health. But that's not all. Across the tower you will find quite a few offering statues, as well as treasure chests, where you can exchange your health for some mighty relics. Different combinations of relics will lead to all kinds of devastating chaos, good as well as sometimes not as good. But you'll want to get your hands on as many of them as you can get, if you're planning to make it to the top. As someone who's not just a developer, but also a big fan of the roguelike genre, it was very important to me personally 
to really focus on these risk-reward mechanics, really making the player think about their choices. Do they want to spend some health to get stronger in the long run? Or keep it to be able to take more hits from the next big boss? Monsters are not the only faces you meet in the tower though. There are quite a few friendly ones, as well as some that might not be as trustworthy. They will help you on your journey, be it by selling you relics, letting you skip a few rooms, or even making some of your health relics stronger. But even if you don't make it to the top on your first try, the journey is far from over. You will return to the metro station where you will be able to unlock new relics, talk to more friendly NPCs, and maybe even learn a new thing or two about the tower that will help you on your next attempt. My goals for Evita have always been to create a gaming experience where no matter what you do, every move feels great and every action feels incredibly satisfying, underlined by stunning visuals that really pull you into the magical, melancholic world of the game and its inhabitants. Revita has been a big passion project of mine for the last four years and I can't wait for everyone to be able to get their hands on it. You can wishlist Revita in Steam right now as well as follow us on Twitter at Revita Game and join us on our Discord, discord.gg slash Revita where we will start our limited alpha very soon which will give you a chance to get your hands on an early build of the game. Thanks for watching and look forward to more on Revita in the future. Change, the only constant in our existence, arguably the foundation of our global fascination with horror. After all, what is horror without the threat of mutation, death, or the cosmic unknown? This is what Transient is all about, the next game from Stormling Studios, the creators of Conarium and the Darkness Within series. In a distant, post-apocalyptic future, the remnants of mankind now shelter in an enclosed citadel, the Dome City Providence, protected from the harsh wilderness beyond. You'll assume the role of Randolph Carter, a man caught up in a mystery that extends beyond even his own consciousness. After a job goes wrong for his team of augmented hackers for hire, he soon learns they are all now being hunted by an unknown entity meaning he'll need to recover his own broken memories before it's too late. In this neon dystopia, you'll explore and investigate, following fragments of data from one lead to the next, as you confront forces beyond your understanding. Your mind is giving you away, Mr. Carter. Focus, Carter. <laughs> you must focus. Don't lose your grip. A classic adventure game. You'll need to solve a variety of immersive environmental puzzles based on the same ancient mythologies and folklore as many of Lovecraft's own works. Through hacking and playing games within the game, you'll edge yourself further towards an uncomfortable truth and go beyond the limits of your own dimension, and maybe your own sanity. Powered by Unreal Engine 4, Transient will offer cutting-edge visuals for storytelling and a gaming experience like nothing Stormling Studios have made before. Drawing inspiration from Lovecraftian works such as Beyond the Wall of Sleep, as well as seminal works of cyberpunk like Blade Runner, the developer's goal is to honour and expand on two genres they love and deliver an unforgettable horror experience. Transient is coming to Windows PC via Steam on October 28th, 2020, and also to Xbox and PlayStation in 2021. It's easier to grasp the aesthetics of the imagination than the visual truth of memories. Precisely. 8% of Dream Reconstructed. Who found her? Didn't you get the report? 
It was her husband. Okay. I'm investigating the brain of a top executive. I'm not really sure the story around her death is true. 16% of dream reconstructed. I saw a lot of other things. I just need to understand her unconscious better. There's such melancholy to all this. When we first started, we didn't know where we were going to end up. The challenges we would face. Joanna, is it you? 100% of dream reconstructed. Welcome to the world of Floor 13 Deep State, a modern dystopian thriller inspired and created by the original developers of the 1991 classic game Floor 13. My name is Shahid Kamal Ahmed. I'm the producer on Floor 13 Deep State and I'm going to brief you on the game. In Floor 13 Deep State, players must keep the government popular by any means necessary. The game takes on a representation of the philosophical ideas represented in The Banality of Evil by Hannah Arendt. Through this lens, the ordering of immoral actions becomes easier to take part in through bureaucratic distance. Some of our plots will challenge how far you will go to keep you and your government in power. As a Director General of the innocuous Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, you'll be presented with plots that vary across domestic terrorism, blood-hungry tech billionaires, elitist hackers, and much more. Your employment relies on choosing the right tool for the job to unravel these plots. Being Director General, gives you access to a variety of teams that will follow your every instruction. Just sign the orders. Search, surveil, ransack, or remove. There's a team available that can be the solution to any problem you might have. Will you send out a search team to follow the suspect's every move? Or will you skip to having someone ransack their house for valuable information at the risk of getting caught? These are the questions you'll have to answer every day as the Director General, and one wrong choice may send your world into chaos. Are you willing to sign the orders? That's it for now. If you're interested in learning more about Floor 13 Deep State, you can wishlist the game right now on Steam and the Humble Store. Floor 13 Deep State releases on November the 2nd, and we can't wait for your performance review as Director General. Hmm. Yo, Beebs! Yo. Let's head back into town and towards the Demon King's castle. It's time to kick his sorry butt out of here. Good luck on your little adventure, Landy. And we're back. 
That demon turf, though. What are you, what are your favorite picks? Uh, for me, I think it would have been transient. I, I just really like that kind of murder mystery sort of feel it's got going on. And, you know, we've seen a lot of really cute, wholesome games, you know, during the show. So it's really nice to kind of have that other side of it as well, the kind of dark, gritty sort of gaming. Yeah, I mean, it, it's cool, like, just this, the, just the showcase in general, having, like, a, a wide breadth of games from pixel art games, new uh, 3D, you know, games, mm -hmm. RPGs, that kind of thing, and then seeing Transient um and the 13th floor like it's it, or floor 13 deep state it's just a nice you know yeah. change in rhythm yeah the signifier as well really liked the look of that yeah, yeah for sure for sure um all right so that's a wrap on the opening reveals and initial guest interviews for the mix next we want to thank everybody for tuning in and we also want to thank our sponsors once again because if it wasn't for them we wouldn't be able to make this magic happen so, yo, thanks, Humble, Humble Games, Modern Wolf, Tiny Build, all the sponsors. And we also want to thank Wilmer Sound uh, for housing us for this uh, amazing showcase, as well as our stream partners, GameSpot, IGN, Twitch, and, of course, Steam. Check out the games on our Steam page. Support the developers. Uh, wish list. Buy them if they're out, because a few games are out today. Yeah, and we have, today and tomorrow. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. And um, and then also there's there's demo builds available now. Um, so yeah, we have we're gonna go to a quick break, show some more or show some tiny build games again. And up next, we're gonna be playing games with the developers. Yep. So we've got live developers on air who'll be joining us and walking us through their games. So please stick around. <laughs>
Welcome back to The Mix Next Live Showcase. This is the second half of our programming and we are gonna be playing games uh, and talking to the developers about their games. The first game that we have is Pumpkin Jack by Head Up Games. It's, it's amazing, I'll be playing it. I'll be, I'll be at the wheel. Uh, Katie's yeah. gonna be leading the discussion. Let's get into the trailer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this is hilarious. Pumpkin Jack, like, immediately. Once upon a time in the great Arkansas Kingdom.
back. That looked incredible. I love the visuals. It's just perfect for Halloween month. On the line, we have Julian from Head Up Games. What up, Julian? Hey, everyone. Hey, Julian. Nice to meet you. You gotta, you gotta turn Hi, us up. Please. Hi, Justin. Can you guys see me? Once again. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Julian? Up, 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 up. Okay, yeah. we got you. We got <laughs> you. We're here, you know. Oh, so, so Justin awesome, will be awesome. playing through. I'll be uh, mainly trying to lead the discussion here. Yeah, let's but, talk. Let's yeah, talk a little bit about a bit about yeah. the game first. What do you want to hear? <laughs> there's my. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Actually, I mean, we're really glad that this, that this game is finally coming out, and uh, it's also an exciting time for us because. Uh, I mean, this game is just made by one guy. I mean, we can talk about this. Wait, really? When we're, when we're playing. Uh, that's, yes, yes. That's Actually, quite it's amazing. just like, uh, yeah, Nicholas, he's from, from France. I think you may see a little bit of influence on that <laughs> in the okay. game. But um, mostly, yes, yeah, just him. He um, didn't do the soundtrack himself. This is from uh, a friend of him. And everything else is like the, the complete design, all made in Unreal by him. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Well, not to cut you off, but I gotta say something. Your background is immaculate. It's pretty amazing. I love all your your board game yeah. lover. I can see it. Your controllers are hanging up in the back. You it got a dope setup. You gotta take care. Yeah, you gotta, we gotta. You gotta, you gotta take care oh, of got stuff a like close that. up of you. Yeah, everybody's gotta see this. It's on point. And you got the shirt, Mike. Oh my god, guys, guys, please, this is my home office. <laughs> Okay, okay. We, we won't impinge on your home too Yeah, much. so we're going to play. We're just going to jump into the game right now. We started from level select, level one. So walk us through a, a little bit through the game. Yeah, sure. So as you can see, you're playing Jack, um, which has been um, hit off by the devil himself because um, the, the world you're playing in, which is called Arkan Seal, I think it's a French word and you can translate it to rainbow uh so it's like okay. the rainbow world um and the reason why you're there is um the the, the devil got bored he really got bored <laughs> because there's nothing happening in this world um all all of the people are friendly all of them are happy and so he said th that gotta change and therefore um he went all his he he took all his monsters um and sent them to to the to the world of Ark and Seal, and they made a huge disaster there Unfortunately, though, the humans had this uh, cool wizard, um, which is very powerful, and he took care of a lot of monsters. And um, now it's like the devil needs someone to take care of this wizard. And since his monsters are busy trying to fend him off and not really able to defeat the wizard, he needs someone powerful. And this is where Jack comes in. And um, yeah, usually Jack would be still in hell for, for the purpose of him tricking the devil for a lot of times. But since he got no one else on hand, uh, Jack is now there to, uh, yeah, to defeat him, uh, the, the, this evil wizard. <laughs> yeah. so, so you say Jack is powerful. What, what can Jack do? What's well, uh, character? for once he can jump twice. <laughs> and okay. um, no, well, other than that, of course, um, you can you can run around with him. Um, he has um, he has the ability to uh, fight with um, with different weapons. He has a an arsenal that will um, evolve over time. So every time okay. you finish a level, you will get new stuff that you can use. Um, okay, Justin may be able here. to. J Justin has a shovel here. D does that? I mean, that's pretty badass, a shovel, but uh, what other weapons can we get? <laughs> so, for example, I, I don't want to spoil it too much, okay, but um, okay. you, will, you will also get, like, at the end of the first level, you'll be able to pick up a new one, which is like a spear, and every oh, weapon nice. is unique. So the spear, for example, has a different pattern, how to fight with it, and um, how to work with it. Then um, there is, like, uh, a kind of flying sword, you will also have weapons that can shoot, for example. Maybe you've seen a little bit of it in the trailer. Yeah. And so, um, and it's always up to you what what kind of weapon you want to choose and cool. um, how you want to fight in this world. I got a quick question. So what were uh, some of the inspirations? It reminds me of the, the early Insomniac stuff, you know, like um, it was Jack and Daxter, yeah. like th yeah, those style think, of I games. Yeah, I think you hit the nail there. Yeah. So um, when, I think when when Nicholas uh, thought about um, 
looking up at Steam what kind of action adventure platformers you can play, he didn't found anything interesting. And that was years ago. And so he was like, oh guys, I, I want something like Jack and Dexter, I want something like Spyro. And uh, he <laughs> yeah. didn't find anything. And that was actually the reason why he started in going into the Unreal Engine and developing the game himself. That is and, awesome. Um, yeah. That, that's feels... what I love about I mean, that, indies. But... Like, indies are just like, I want this game and I don't have it. I'm going to make it myself. Yeah. It love feels it. really good. Yeah, like, exactly. the, the controls are legit. It feels like a classic PS2. You know what I mean? Early PS2 game. Yeah, I think there was a lot of effort took, uh, that w which took place here. And uh, I think Nicholas scrapped the idea of this game like three times and made the, it whole new. Um, it, I think the first game was called... Um, oh, let, let me check that up. I think something like uh, Curse of the Scarecrow. So uh -huh. it wasn't even about Jack. But uh, since he felt like this wasn't the right one, he, um, he, he scrapped the, the complete idea, um, but kept the mechanics and, and reiterated it. And um, I think the, the one we see now is like the, the best thing he could came, come up with. And I think that worked pretty well. <laughs> I, I love the fact that, you know, we can't go out for Halloween this year. I love that so many games, including this one, are still giving us a kind of Halloween-y experience. When is the release? That's true. Oh, it's uh, actually on the 23rd this month, so uh, you will have it available on Halloween for, I think, almost every platform. Unfortunately, um, we still need a bit of time for the PS4, but um, we'll be on it, and I hope we'll be uh, finished with that as soon as possible as well. But other than that, you can play it on the Switch, you can play it on the PC, and on Xbox One. Perfect. And is it just single player or is there any multiplayer aspect to it as well? Oh, uh, that, that would be nice, right? Playing this with someone else. I mean, you have the crow guy with you, right? But yeah, no, unfortunately, yeah. or what, what unfortunately is not the right term. I think it's okay. like, it's designed to be a single player experience. You can, I mean, you can watch it with friends and play it, but um, it's mostly about um, yourself getting the experience and, um, and playing it. So sure, no multiplayer sure. yet. How long has the game been in development? Oh, you died. Yeah, yeah. Mm. This is this Good is question. not a, a simple game. The, like the the <laughs> platforming elements had me booty tight the whole time. I'm like, I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna shut. I want to talk. I want to ask you a question, <laughs> but I gotta get these jumps right. You need to concentrate, right? Yes, yeah, okay. for sure. Uh, well, I dig that though. It's legit. <laughs> it's great. Um, well, I think the um, oh, you you gotta ask the question again. I forgot it. <laughs> Oh, uh, how long has the game been in development? One developer, oh, yeah. so... So, yeah, Nicholas, I think he, he started, like, in 2015, something like that. But once again, the game has been scrapped, like, two times until the third iteration yeah. went really well. And that was, like, I think two and a half years ago, something like that. So, um... That's almost five years from, from concept to finished work. Sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, oh, yeah, th this is actually a really cool part because this is like another thing you will... you will get off the sk get out of the skills that uh, Jack has. But, I love yeah, how let's expressive see. that owl is. His little twitchy ears. <laughs> yeah, he's so extra cute. cute. There's a lot of humor in this game and also a lot of hidden stuff that you uh, have to experience or find yourself. And and um, some cool references as well. Is that a checkpoint? Or no, okay. it's not a checkpoint. Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> oh wow. Cute. Okay, this is dope. So yeah, there's like um, a lot of different sections in this game. It's not just Jack himself, um, and you're not always moving with him like you do. Uh, oh yeah, you have done already. But um, sometimes you will just be his head with these little roots coming out of the head and you have to uh, try and do some puzzles. Oh, I get it, I get but it. But there's also it. other sections. <laughs> like, come on, man. Yeah, there's also other sections you have to take care of where you even have to ride horses or carts and stuff like that. And um, so there's a lot of action going on. And of course, uh, I think we're not able to finish this uh, level <laughs> today, yeah. so um, let me let me spoil you a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Every okay. time you will be 
you will reach the end of a level, there will be a huge boss with different attack patterns you have to take care of and you have to defeat in some way or another. So, uh, yeah. so in this section, do I need to put the boxes on top of each other somehow? Yeah, it's a little trick behind it. So uh, I think you're on the right track there. But you, instead of putting both boxes there, you need to just put one up and take the other to the other side of the room to get up first. Oh, derp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Super derp. But I, I got that and one. And then you can, like... I, I love the squelching the sound and... of the roots. Squelch, squelch. Oh, <laughs> I get it. So okay, cute. cool. This is dope. I dig this. these, like, yes. environmental puzzles. It's so... Yeah, it's so Great cool. Great job. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Yay. And just the aspect that you're now is just his head. It's, that's really fun. <laughs> Adds a lot of character. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is like the first level you're playing. There will be five more coming up, and um, each level I think you can play around one to two hours, depending on how, how skilled you are. Okay. And um, there's also small skulls in each level that you can collect. And if you collect enough, you'll be able to um, get skins uh, or buy skins for Jack. Uh, to make him look different. Oh, that's. Uh, cool. Oh yeah, one more cool thing. Yeah, one more thing that I haven't mentioned yet is, if you ever collect a weapon, and uh, you're not sure um, if you want to use this anymore, or if you want to go back to another level, you can always take the weapon with you. So once you acquire something, it will stay with you for the whole period of playing. So you can always go back to a level and play with another weapon, try it again. And because there's also a speedrun approach to every level. And um, for yeah. sure. Okay. That's cool. Well, thank you so much yeah. for sharing the game. Wishlisted now on Steam. It's on uh, the mixed next Steam page, correct? So you should be able to. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. We are, we're there. I think the demo should also be up. Um, so nice. you'll be able to play the first level, which you just experienced. And yeah, thank you guys for playing, and um, thank you for for the whole show. It was really cool, and I, I've looked almost through everything, and um, <laughs> getting excited for all these titles that are up there. So Aww, thank yeah. you, Julian. Keep it up. <laughs> yeah, sh Aww. shout out to Head Up, like for sure. Yeah. And Julian, you're you're Woo! always awesome, always <laughs> yeah. welcome on the show. It's awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Julian. All right, so next we're moving on to relocation, radical relocation which is a game about my anxiety about moving house. Let's check out the trailer. So that was the trailer for Radical Relocation. We now have Matt and Gareth on board, on the line. What is happening? Hey, Matt and Gareth. Okay, we're just... Uh, yeah, we're having a little trouble hearing you over here. Okay, yeah, so... Can you uh, hear us all right? Or... Yeah, we got you, we got okay. you. Yeah, yeah, so Radical... Oh, okay, okay. It looks hilarious. Like, off the bat, just checking out your, your initial trailer, it just, like, yeah. Yeah, I, I love games that get ridiculous with physics, and this is the prime example of that. So I'll be playing through while you guys chat. Yeah, let, well, let's let's talk for a second. What yeah. um, what inspired the game initially? Um, well, the main inspiration was actually from um, 
from Matthew's Matthew's dad, who and it came um, when we decided to join the Luden Dare competition to develop a game, and um, we were pretty new at the time to game development, and um, I think it's a seventy-two hour competition, and we spent the first probably twenty-four hours just coming up with the idea, and we were kind of struggling to come up with something. Um, and so Matthew's dad actually came up with an idea, and I think it was for for driving cars across um, a bridge that you had yeah. to stack with furniture. Yeah, it was based um, on Poly Bridge originally, and we yeah we expanded it from there to neighborhoods and cars. That's cool. So yeah. we're gonna jump right into the game right now. Yeah, I'm really excited to show this off. I've already uh, tinkered around a bit with it. Haven't gotten very far. I'm pretty bad at moving house, as it turns out. But yeah, so this is our first level. There is a suitcase on a car. <laughs> <laughs> where, are you, where are you all located, by the way? Uh, we're from New Zealand. Oh, so okay. I think it's the other side of the world to you guys. Yeah, <laughs> nice. But I'm actually from Australia, so I'm from next door to you guys. Uh. <laughs> Yay! I like how I passed that, but the car just keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can drive through at full speed. <laughs> I have I have a question for you guys. Um, I'm sure you've moved house a few times. Can you tell me about your most traumatic move, and what happened? Actually, I've only moved once. I must really? have been five years old. I actually don't remember a whole lot. Um, well, I originally actually come from South Africa, so um, we had quite a big move coming over to New Zealand, and. Yeah, um, a lot of things were stolen, a lot of oh, things were wow. damaged in transit, so, yeah. That's crazy. It was, it was a bit traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. What do you call it? Moving? I'm just curious. Oh, I am, I'm not good at this. <laughs> what do you guys call moving? Yeah, we probably uh, just what do you call it? Yeah. In Australia, just moving house? Oh, moving house, that's right. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard oh, that. Oh, really? So. Yeah, that's interesting. What about, oh, what about yeah. over there? It's just, it's just moving, you know what I mean? Just moving? <laughs> yeah, I love it. I'm going to say that now, moving house. Okay, I am not going to mess this up this time. It reminds me of, like, uh, initially, when you when you have like the area that you have to get to, uh, Crazy Taxi. Did you guys play that growing up at all? No, not familiar. No, I haven't even heard of Crazy Taxi. You guys are you guys are hella young. <laughs> <laughs> that shows how old yeah. I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're both nineteen years old. Yes, oh, wow. so I'm double your age. Oh my, this yeah, suddenly got a lot harder. You got when you have a chance, check out. This is not the same. But check out uh, Crazy Taxi because it has like you have to go into the parking spot, you know, like to drop people off and get, have people get on. This is so interesting, like Tetris with cars. Yeah, this this got yeah. a lot harder really suddenly. So how, when was the Ludum Dare, and like how how long have you been developing the game? So we entered the twenty seventeen Ludum Dare. So oh, that was okay. end. 2017. Yep. So it's been about three years. A really long journey. Nice. Oh um, like... man, yeah, we did. We restarted a few times and mm. stuff. So, yeah, we because we were we we're pretty um, young at the stage and we weren't sure where we wanted to take the idea. So, mm. um, yeah, it took a while to actually get off the ground. But then once we got out, we got on track. We just managed to, yeah, start developing the whole game. Mm. That's cool. So what's the process been like as far as, you're, are you releasing it strictly on Steam or are you, is it going to be multi-platform? Um, so right for now it's just going to be a PC game, but um, we are actually releasing it on um, GOG Games um, and that's release um, has just happened today actually, so. Oh, yeah, so congratulations. We're on Steam and GOG Games, yeah. Mm. Um, and possibly in the future might come to more platforms, but um, we'll think about that later. Hmm. So, uh, you mentioned you guys are quite young. Is this your first game? Ever? Like, or We've made... like your first uh, commercial game? Or are you just like young yeah, geniuses? Yeah, it's our first commercial game. <laughs> so we've made three others before this, I think. Wow. Yeah. This is our, our biggest project so far. 
That's awesome. You guys are you guys brothers? Or just for great friends? No, no we're, we're, we met in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we've just been friends ever since because we share a lot of the same interests and we're both, yeah, quite innovative and we like to try new things and yeah. Mm -hmm. That's always that's always the best when you can like vibe with your friends and make games. Yeah, and yeah. Um, now we're going to university together and we're both doing engineering, so yeah. That's cool. So after this, are you going to be work? I know you guys are going to university. Are you going to, you, you think you're going to work on another game? Or are you going to chill for a second, let this just uh, pop off and then go back? I think, I think I'll, I'd like to give it a little time myself just to recover. It's been a, <laughs> a very long yeah, I understand journey, that. but yeah, we're definitely interested in making oh, yeah. games. Personally, um, so I've I've mainly been doing art for the gaming, but I'd like to start learning to program a bit more. Um, oh, so cool. yeah, I'm going to be right onto moving on to a new game, just just as a personal project to to learn some new skills. Hmm. That's cool. You yeah, try to that's... cheat real quick. <laughs> you try to go through the... that did. person's lawn. I did. I, that's exactly what <laughs> you thought. We didn't see that. That was amazing. Oh, you can play across as many people's lawns as you want. Yeah, no. anything goes. Uh, I like I like how the watermelons just yeah. like dribble out. Yeah, that's a out. beautiful detail. Um, you can actually lie the fridge down if you press the space bar, space which bar? might help a little bit. Ooh, okay. Yep. So that will just that will help oh, a little bit. Nice. Okay. You were on hard mode for a second. <laughs> I didn't know you could flip yeah, the furniture around. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, if you press tab, you can see some some help. Oh, okay. Tips and stuff. Good to know, thank you. What has the feedback and response been so far when you're, you've been oh. showcasing this game at different festivals and such like that? Yeah, overall the response has been great. People enjoy it. I think um, personally for me, the favorite thing has been watching streamers. It's really satisfying watching people enjoy what we've made. It's, it's a really good feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of positive feedback. Um, there's been some people who've been frustrated, but I feel that's kind of part of the sort of game. Yeah, yeah. it's challenging. Yeah, it you is don't a challenging want people, game. Yeah, you don't want people to play properly, right? You want them to stuff up. It's more fun that way. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's being frustrated and then wow. coming back later and giving it another go is definitely part of the experience of this game. Hmm. Ooh, Otherwise, it wouldn't be challenging enough. So G GOG and Steam today, or it's already been released, or is it GOG first, and then Steam? Um, Steam, Steam was released, uh, I think it was the 31st of August or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, nice. And then GOG was released yesterday, so... Oh, sweet, yeah, sweet. It's been out so everybody a while. Can... So remind me, you have an expansion pack coming out, or an update at least, with like helicopters and stuff, is that right? When's that coming out? Yes, that was released this morning as well. Oh, this morning. Uh, oh, nice. nice. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Yeah, so that features 12 helicopters and 20 new levels in an Arctic environment. It's a good challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely an interesting way to move. It's awesome. I, I've never moved <laughs> yeah. by <a> helicopter. <laughs> we appreciate you showing sure the game. Well. Yeah, we appreciate you guys showing the game and, and joining us. Uh, everybody viewing, check the game out. Buy it. Yeah. It's now you can now buy it. GOG Steam on the Mix Next uh, Steam page too, right? You guys are there, um, or on their your their own personal yeah. page. But yeah, we appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your game. It's fun to watch. And um, thank you for tuning in. I'm sure it's very early in the morning. Yeah, thank you for so having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Next up, we have another cool indie game that we're going to be playing through. Uh, this is Doors of Insanity. Check out the trailer. Product not yet rated. Welcome to Purgatory, the land of lost souls, the realms of madness. Does anyone have what it takes to survive the nightmares of this realm and open the Doors of Insanity? Join our hero riding his mighty steed on a quest of redemption. Monstrosities and damnation stand in their way, armed with sword, shield, and mystical cards. 
No defense, just attack. They will carve a path of merciless terror through their enemy. Whoa. I mean, we just started. Um, let's try that again. Witness a world where chilling on a boat on the river sticks makes you look like a total badass. Because you know you won't be thrown overboard to hell. Because you are really, really awesome. Limbo cannot hold you. You deserve paradise. Use your sexy charms. Befriend a scary witch. Master spells with your magnificent mind. Summon awesome allies for your enchanted entourage. And give respect to beings of infinite powers. Hey, what a cool story. Using a new powerful deck of defense cards, you will block, parry, and repost your way to victory. Oh, not again. Were heroes always this fragile? <clears throat> Strap yourself in. Uh, again? Summon a 1940s boy band. No! I'm gonna be honest, this is not going the way we wanted it to. Okay, come on. Alright, next hero. More me for the grind. In a world where everyone dies and hope is futile. Yes! Alright! Good card choices, excellent equipment. Okay, solid tactics. We got this. We have our hero. Now, let's swing open the door of insanity where no sword is too big armor too thick ally too obnoxious in this totally awesome game that you should definitely buy and that was the gorgeous trailer for door uh <laughs> doors of insanity we have logan on the line uh we're gonna be playing through the game what's up logan how's it going hey logan oh it's going good thanks for having me yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing the game. I, you know, I was in tune with this game during the Gorilla Collective when we showed it. It's just, it's just so gorgeous. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the game? We're gonna go straight to gameplay right now. Yeah, and, uh, I, I'm sorry. It. I just had to jump in. I love this game so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it. So, um, Doors of Insanity is basically a journey through kind of a psychological purgatory. So everything that you see within the game. Almost half of the content that we've created is straight from lucid dreams. So what we do as a team, we take various supplements, interrupt sleep, and do things that allow us to bring back like crazy connections that you're not going to make in your waking life. So that's why everything, you might notice things are a bit bizarre or sometimes they feel like there's a, a thread connecting them, but it's not as connected like you wouldn't think of it just in your daily life. And that's what we tried to do. Make something new. Yeah, it's very surreal. The color, the vibrant colors are great. And like, you, just the the cards, I actually want to collect the cards. Are you going to have the decks yeah. available? Because they're, they're like gorgeous. We talked about that. It'd be dope. Yeah, that'd be so fun to do. Yeah. Are it's you, on the maybe pile. So you're, you're the game developer, right? Right. I'm the programmer. Oh, and, okay. you know, I have some design help. Um, our main designer does the majority of like, all the stats and kind of the thought processes and stuff and the rest of us kind of sprinkle in uh things within his main design okay cool just the reason i ask because you know another indie they're they're awesome we've been working with them for years you know so i just wanted to find the correlation you know what i mean are you the one of the developers oh yeah the publisher gotcha. so that's that's good context those guys are awesome they're totally awesome they took our career from virtually unknown or like semi-popular indie games and they're like putting us on the map so we couldn't nice. be more appreciative of them so katie's been spending time in the game you know previous to uh, uh starting uh the event today um and she's just been kind of killing it what, what are your what are your insights really? in the game yeah what's Maybe. your technique i i don't think i really have a technique i just kind of throw cards at monsters um I, I like to load up with like um absorb spells and buffs first and then just kind of go for slash oh, yeah. I, i'm much more of an attacker than a defensive person so that's yeah, that's, that's kind of my approach that's kind of my approach too okay i'm kind of a i'm kind of a turtle player i don't like to get hit <laughs> so can you talk yeah. about your inspirations behind the game and, and a little bit about develop uh development yeah, um, so we have a lot of lore from our past projects 
And it has all been kind of culminating into like sneaky little stories that, wow, that all nice. come together. So we started to build these encounters. I mean, kind of even before we built the game, we have this encounter feature that hopefully we'll see it within the demo here. Um, and the basic storyline is built anew every time you play through based oh, upon who you see, who you interact with, you know. So it's basically a kind of a run through purgatory each time. And by the end, you should be a completely different character than you were in the last 10 times. That's cool. The character creation system is pretty... Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to thank you for putting in all of those uh, customization options, especially for female characters. Yeah, Not, not all definitely. games are doing that yet, so it's really cool to be able to, you know, choose what shade of purple I want my hair to be, things like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it was actually new for us, so we're, we're happy with how it turned out. It's really I, robust. I, I don't too. trust this apple. Do you trust this apple, Justin? I do trust this apple. It looks right. shiny and clean. I, I'm going to yeah. eat it. The store. Oh, no, it did hit Nice. Me. I, was, uh, I was actually thinking a worm was going to pop yeah, out me and too. bite you real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this looks like the kind of game where you don't quite know what to expect. The Yeah, the surreal sur yeah. of it is like, yeah. like, that's what really draws me to it. The characters just look really interesting and funky and kind of, you know, diabolical you know mm. yeah that's kind of what we want is the kind of dream you feel throughout yeah. the whole thing yeah definitely what, what were some of your it. what was some of your previous games i'm just curious um one of our most popular games is great heroes beard i don't know if you've seen that on steam but it's basically an idler where you are constantly building up the character kind of like what we have here but in a simpler form so we discovered that that was working for us and then we tried to take that to like a much more attractive format with Doors of Insanity. And then um, before Great Heroes Beard, there's about five other games too. So as oh, a team, wow. we've, we've been together a while. That's dope. That really, it really shows just the execution and the way everything. The, the, um, the initial animation that you guys dropped was, it's legit. Oh yeah. We have a pretty killer artist. We're super happy with the stuff that he comes up with and surprises us with. The best part is like, if you haven't played your game for a while and the artist went and updated all the animations, you can come back to it as a player because like, you have no <laughs> idea what it's going to look like. That's cool. So when are you dropping? Um, the, the early access should be really soon and that's going to be PC and on Steam. And then nice. we're going to try to get all the kinks worked out and get a lot of good feedback and kind of take that iterative approach and that totally Get it ready before sense. we go to yeah. console. And if it, it seems like that fits really well for this this style of game, are there any yeah, of these you, like? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, because yeah, we don't have all the answers for what people want. We, yeah, we know that sure. we've seen a lot of card games already, so we want to yeah. break off from the pattern and bring up some new stuff. Ah, oh wow! Oh my God, That's that what I was expecting God. from the from the app. <laughs> That's yeah. And I wasn't expecting that from the treasure chest because the apple worked out so well. Yeah. <laughs> I was secretly hoping you'd get bit. No, no offense. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so what what are some of the card games that you were looking at as you're developing? You're like, oh, that is dope. Or like, you know what I mean? Well, of course we played Slay the Spire, but then we also had a lot of physical card games we liked. And I was oh, a big okay, Magic the nice. Gathering fan growing up. So I just love basically all card games. But one That's of the cool. other uh, big influences is Dead Cells. We really like the replay ability of Dead Cells. Nice. So we try to pull a lot of different things together. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I mean, it must help that you love, you know, card games, obviously, um, to help like shape the way this game plays, looks, feels, that kind of thing. Yeah. For our designer, it was his first time doing a card game, so it took him like a lot of relearning it's not just an rpg because we knew how to yeah. do rpgs already but there's a lot of stuff that that changed for him so i'm sure he felt some pain <laughs> where's where the <laughs> art pain. where's the art style influence from i'm just i'm super curious he picks up from a lot of stuff he really loves japanese animation of course okay um i don't want to pin him down on anything and then yeah. he get mad at me <laughs> you know i understand that for sure Usually we send them ideas, you know, like one time I had this dream that I was fighting with a giant sword and it was made out of scoops of ice cream. So then he just draws it up for you. That's dope. 
Yeah. That's super cool. He can pretty much draw anything. Really cool dude. One of the things that turned out best in this game are the summons too. All these little helpers with their yeah. animations and stuff. I, I love the little helpers. I feel like I They make you feel like you're not single player. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. Okay. The bee is extra gangster too. Oh my too. god, I am so... Oh, oh yeah. no. <laughs> right. Aww. Got dead. Look, that's hilarious. They're, they're just celebrating my death. That's yeah. rude. <laughs> At least they give you a dance though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope someone does that when I die. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, a Thank you so much for uh, sharing Doors of Insanity. The game looks amazing. I can't wait to play it more um, and, and get it on the full release or early access, of course. Um, and where could we find it again and find you guys? We're on Steam. You can grab a demo right now and play what, what we were just looking at. So yeah, definitely. So and love. thank you guys for having us. Thank you so much for joining us, Logan. Yeah, thank you so of much. Of course. Hopefully Talk we'll do this again sometime. For right. sure, for sure. So next up we have Button City. Button City next. Here's the trailer. So that was the cute and gorgeous Button City trailer. We have Ryan Woodward on the line. My brother. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Brothers at the heart. How's it going? <laughs> good, good. Uh, I like the little the character on your shoulder and the pull-up. Oh, that's thank dope. You, thank yeah, you. That, that's really cute. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for joining us. Um, Katie's going to be hopping on the wheel and just running through it right now. So can you tell us about ah. the game? Yeah, so Button City is a narrative adventure game about uh, a young fox named Fennel, this little guy, uh, and his friends trying to save their local arcade from being shut down by this greedy fat cat who wants to turn it into a big box mart. Uh, so you're on this like Saturday morning hijinks adventure to uh, save the arcade all while uh, trying to become arcade champions and take down your rivals at a really awesome game called Gobobots. This is so cute. Can I ask, why did you decide on animals as opposed to like just a game about people? I mean, besides animals uh, being adorable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this entire game started with my wife, uh, Shandine, who made, uh, who started just making 3D art. And the first thing that she made was this cute little fox who eventually oh. became Fennel. And I think like, just all of our games are just super adorable. Uh, we tend to, to make uh, animal games anyways. Uh, honestly, I'm surprised it's not a cat, but uh, we have a cat <laughs> character in there as well. So uh, that's, that's kind of the main reason. My wife just loves uh, cats, and people really oh. seem to resonate with, with the game. I think your wife and I would get along. I also oh, love definitely. cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the diorama feel and that you can interact with anything. Like that's that's really interesting. And also the the um how you reference like different video game systems and things like that. Like kind of where did the the idea behind like the arcade um uh, the arcade situation come about? So a lot of it comes from um you know, just like our lives where we're part of like different gaming communities and we're part of the arcade game community here. Uh, I'm on like the leaderboard for this game called Maximum Tune 5. Uh, and we were part of the local Splatoon, um, nice. you know, game meetup. So we would have tournaments and stuff. So that part of it is like that local like community and just supporting each other uh, and just having a really great uh, friend group. 
Uh, we were also inspired by just games that we really, really love. Um, we already mentioned Splatoon. That inspired some of uh, GoboBots, which is the main game within uh, Button City. Um, and we're also just inspired by just so many things just around us within uh, the gaming community and stuff, uh, along with like anime and just so much media, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The pastel colors are like really striking in the, in the game too. Yeah, where she pulls a lot of her influences from things like um, kid culture and toy, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, from toys from like uh, early 2000s, so like Tamagotchi, uh, like uh, the robot dogs, things like that. Going back further, I actually get a bit of a Polly Pocket feel. I grew up with Polly Pocket in yes. the 90s. Wow. Yeah, I, yeah that's I, pretty I mean, amazing. Just, like, that does. The, yeah, the fact that I could like touch the toast and stuff, I remember doing yes. that in Polly Pocket, just touching little bits. The compartmentalized, like, each area is really endearing. I, I really dig that. <laughs> I, I love the writing in this game. Put down such trifling things and contemplate a quiet life. I don't think so. <laughs> where are you um, I'm really happy that people... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, where are you guys located? Because you're talking about your community and that type of thing, which is obviously really, really important. Yeah, so we're from New Mexico, and we have, like, a really, really tight-knit community in terms of, like, gaming and in terms of our game dev community as well. We don't really have, like, an industry out here, so we're yeah. very grassroots and, like, kind of punk rock DIY type of stuff. Obviously, this doesn't necessarily have the punk aesthetics, but we, we live kind of, like, just like the DIY, kind of, like, let's do this, let's make something cool, um, even if it's, like, bright, hopeful, and, like, wholesome, you know? Yeah, I think I saw it for the first time on Wholesome Games. Shout out to Wholesome Games, which is awesome too. Oh, oh, fun. Oh my god, look at all these places I can visit. Justin, tell me where to go. What um, looks food. Cafe. All right, <laughs> yep. That's it, food. <laughs> so in the demo here that you're playing, uh, this is all exclusive story content. Uh, so it's Kids Day in uh, the world of Button City and all the games at the arcade are free. So what you're doing oh, nice. here is you're looking for uh, other kids to join your team so you could take down uh, the worst team in the arcade. All of a sudden they became super good for some reason. Uh, so you want to get together a team and you know put them in their place. Okay. And also eat food? <laughs> uh, you can get a coffee here. <laughs> what's cool about uh, what's cool about some of the consumables in the game is that it will affect the arcade games as well. So if you get a coffee, oh, uh, you can get three different styles: either like just normal coffee, extra bitter, or coffee grounds. That'll make the game harder. Um, oh, so that one okay. it won't affect uh, in the demo, but in the full release, you'll be able to be like, oh, I want an extra challenge, so I'm gonna take. Um, you know, I'm going to drink some coffee, I'm going to eat a jelly donut, so I'm going to have, like, half health and, like, double the difficulty. So if you want, like, a super hard challenge, you can. Or if you want to make it super easy, you can as well. We also have cosmetic items that you could get from the prize counter at Button City. Okay. You read my mind. I was like, we got to play some arcade <laughs> games now. So if you'd like, we actually unlocked, specifically for you, uh an arcade game that nobody has played yet outside of the studio. Nice. Oh, All right, us, we got you. Yeah, to tell us how to get to it. So let's go inside Button City. Okay. And we're gonna meet our friend Sorrel and she's gonna kind of explain uh, kind of the situation that's going on. But we're gonna be kind of putting that to, us, uh, to the side and we're gonna be playing some Revolution Racer, which is a electric drift racing game where you uh, race electric streetcars down Watermelon Mountain. Wow, <laughs> nice. Okay. Watermelon Mountains. Yeah. I love how expressive all these animals are. <laughs> Yeah, my wife, she also does all the animations and stuff for, for this main part. Uh, we have another artist named Val. She does all of the uh, graphics for the arcade games, and both of them look absolutely amazing. Such, you know, like, bright and, like, powerful uh, graphics. I just love it. It, it looks like uh, vector art just, like, come to life, you know, yeah, like a, does, a 2D definitely. image come to life. Yeah, you have a really unique aesthetic going on here. Very distinct. So if you'd like to try out the uh, Revolution Racer, go to the front of the line and talk to the wolf there. This guy? 
Yeah, that's Basil. He works at the arcade, and uh, since he has to go off to college soon, he wants to put his uh, legacy on the leaderboard. So he's kind of hogging the machine, but hopefully he... Yeah, cool. This is the right build. <laughs> I was worried for a second. Um, but you'll get to try out Revolution Racer. It's pretty cool. Whoa. Oh, look how cute And if my it car. breaks, this, we haven't fully tested this yet, so <laughs> hopefully hopefully it should work well for you. Ooh. Well, thanks for so giving us the exclusive. Yeah, this, this is yeah. way awesome. Oh my god, this... This drives really well, it's really fun. So, you drift to uh, charge up your batteries, uh, and then once oh, you charge up cool. your boost, you'll be able to just fly forward, which is uh, nice. something really cool about battery tech. Uh, if you have like a high capacitors, you could use that for like kind of instant torque and like kind of store that up. Uh, so we're kind of playing with like, uh, what's kind of cool about electric vehicles with a uh, regen technology and things like that, and then making it anime cool and drifting and stuff like that. Yeah. I love that you included environmentally friendly vehicles. Oh, I just <laughs> love electric vehicles. I just, yeah. Oh, ah, yeah. ah, they're so cool. They're so oh, cool. Oh, they're so much fun, <laughs> yeah. How am I doing? I feel like I'm not doing particularly well. I can't even see my opponent. That's okay. Uh, ben, our programmer, he may have made this part too hard. Uh, he, he tests it uh, against himself sometimes, so he has a, uh, he has, yeah, he has a bit of a skill gap on there. So we'll be balancing out the rest of the game and some of the arcade games as well in this. That that happens all the time. What role yeah. do you play on the team? I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, so we have four people in total full time. Uh, mm -hmm. Myself, my wife. Um, Shandine, uh, our artist, Val, and then Ben, our second programmer. And then we have uh, a really great musician named uh, Pedro Silva. Uh, they, uh, you might know them for uh, their project Slime Girls, and they also did the soundtrack for oh, Ooplets. Nice. Cool. Yeah, and then we also have uh, an audio person named Devin. Um, and what's fun is, like, in the demo, you can actually find all of us uh, in there as our own uh, animal characters. Oh, that's so cute. What animal are you? Uh, so I'm this orange cat, and we're part of the uh, Scrub Squad. So the entire Scrub Squad is actually the dev team. Um, yeah. Uh, so, That's hilarious. Uh, when you squad. Play, <laughs> yeah. So when you when you play, you're actually going up against the um, the development team. And those two that are dancing on the on the rhythm game right there, that's our musician and our sound engineer. Nice. They are great dancers. That's cool that you can incorporate the team for sure. How long have you been in development? So we officially started development back in 2018, and this was with my wife and I uh, doing this part-time while we worked full-time jobs. And then in 2019, we were given the opportunity to go full-time, and we brought on uh, Ben and Val as well. Nice. Where can, where can we find the game? When is it going to be released? So Button City is on Steam right now, so if you could wishlist it and download the demo, that would be amazing. You could find out more information at buttoncitygame.com and download some freebies, including this uh, printable uh, Fennel the Fox. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, at Button City. Um, and yeah, we'll be announcing more platforms soon, but Steam is the main one, uh, and it'll be available for uh, PC and Mac. Nice, nice. Thank you so much, Ryan. We appreciate it. Button City's dope. Yeah, yeah, thank you so is, very much. Yeah, this is one of the ones I'm looking forward to most. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up, we have another trailer from a game called Gone Viral. Then Justin will be playing through a bit of it. Word. Oh, what's this? Licky fan gift. This is a fake gift. It's a lie. You just spawned a boss in the middle of this room? Yeah, let's go for it. Ball pants. <laughs> <laughs> There's rubber duckies now dropping. Who voted for this? Your event in coming. Okay, bomb sticky mess rush multiplication. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh, what is happening? Didn't that hurt? Oh no. No, I didn't want to take that. I didn't want to pick that up. What's up, baby? Woo! 
And we're back. Uh, that was Gone Viral, which looks utterly fantastic. And we are really excited to have Jeremy from Akapura Games on the line to talk to us about it while Justin plays through. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, how's it going? What's happening? Hey, how are you doing? Uh, I've been sitting around watching all sorts of cool indie games for like the last hour or so. This is a, you guys are doing great with this. <laughs> what are you really looking forward to? I have to say Grime looks really good to me. Like I just love the art style. I like mm. that sort of like impactful combat. I thought that was that was pretty rad. The um all in all though, I mean just you haven't really had a dud on the show, you know, it's just been great stuff. Awesome. Yeah, uh Grime was actually one of uh, Justin's. Yeah, that as well. Grime looks dope. I I like that whole idea of sucking in the you know, the different enemies and stuff and chain yeah, it's it's sick. <laughs> yeah. But but I think this may this may say something personal about you, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. I know, right? Like, gr I'm, I'm extra grimy, though. I'm not going to even front. But Gone Viral has been kind of on our radar for quite a minute, you know, quite a bit. What were your influences behind it? I mentioned uh, uh, Running Man and Smash TV. Like, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, also those things are also these, like, 80 game show kind of games. Um, you know, the youngsters in the audience may not even remember Smash TV. Yeah. But the... Um, but it's like, what would that feel like in kind of the modern streamer era has been our take on it. Because this is a game that we built where, you know, you've been captured and you're a gladiator and you're being streamed out to the masses. So you yeah. have to, like, get fans, like, you know, Hunger Games style. Um, mm -hmm. And the more you can pull off cool physics combo, you know, knock enemies into each other, use traps, it gets the fans geeked up and they start, like, airdropping you mutations. They start sending you events to mess with you, all that kind of thing. I, I really like the, the concept um, of uh, being forced to go viral in this arena. It's kind of pretty crazy thinking about like, you know, be, things go viral on Twitter and TikTok all the time, but then kind of putting people in an arena and making a game out of that. Really interesting concept for how to Absolutely. Of that? Um, well, we just love roguelikes. You know, the, um, there have been so many good ones. Hades recently, of course, but also, you know, going back to Binding Isaac, the Nuclear Throne. Um, we love the random generated dungeons. We love the you know, games where you need to advance by learning stuff out and have crazy combos and synergies. And it felt like a natural fit for that. Um, especially, you know, we as a team have watched thousands of hours of people playing roguelikes online. And so uh, it's, it's very natural to us to be like, oh, skilled players getting fans to get donations and cool stuff. Uh, Can we you even did a twit. What's that? Oh, I was going to say after after you, you finish your question, you got to tell me, like, some combos and stuff to do. Walk me through this a little bit. Well, what you want to do in general is your sword is great for knocking guys into traps and stuff. You do, um, if you can knock an enemy into an enemy, uh, that's going to do about triple damage. Uh, okay. It damages him, it damages the enemy you knock him into. Um, the, uh, also, and you're nearing death, which is a key part of the roguelike experience. So uh, you're about one hit. So look for the little hearts in the ground. They'll help you out. Um, okay. So knock dudes into dudes. Everything has physics. So if you like hit the little spike balls um, with your sword, oh, they'll go flying. I see. If you hit guys, combat's oh. as much about positioning as anything else. Where if you can pull a guy into a trap, that's way more damage than just hit him with your sword or whatever. Okay, that that's makes always going to be your goal. Sense. We make it very quick to get back in to go do the next thing. Uh, every I time you play, things randomize. You're like fans have different personalities. They'll send you different stuff. You get different mutations. Um, the real goal is that everything adds up for very different runs each time you play. Um, you start off and the fans give you a new gift. Maybe this time you have giant arms. Maybe this time uh, you've shrunk. Maybe this time, you know, uh, they're sending you a ball pit event where you know, the entire room's filled with beach balls and duckies. The goal is really to have a lot of things change up run to run to run. That's really awesome. So this is, yeah, this is like a really interesting take on rogue lights. And we, we like the physics combat a lot. Like, every th time you find these little mutations, you'll pick stuff up. Now you can shoot bullets through people. Um, every time you hit an enemy now, spikes will grow out of them. So now, knocking guys and the guys does even more damage. Um, we want it to sort of feel like you are having a unique experience each time where, oh, this time I have a rocket launcher. I'm just, you know, wrecking face with orbiting multi-shot rockets flying everywhere. This time I'm using my sword and, you know, making that more powerful. And it's all about smacking guys. Um, the... Uh, uh, our goal really is to make sure that you are having a neat experience every time. Yeah, and it feels really good. good. Oh man, doing feel is like critical as a dad. Yeah. Like you really end up in a lot of time trying to make that work. 
One of the trickier things we did is, um, you know, a lot of these roguelikes, you know, Isaac does a fantastic job of your tears changing over time. Mm. We made it so that all the different mutations affect how you wall up enemies. Um, if you get multi-shot, you break enemies up into three, and you can use them to damage more people. If you um, get orbit, then all the guys you wall up stop orbiting around, and now they give you, you know, the crowd gets more excited. Ooh, a boss, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. I love how at the end of each run, there's like a fame meter yeah, the, the, we try to have some rewards because death is a common thing in roguelikes. Um, we are worried for that. Some fans will actually um, each your fans have personalities. If you have sadistic fans, this model is kind of real world Twitch chat. They always vote for stuff that might kill you. They're always yeah. rooting for like the enemies to beat you up, and the uh, they actually reward you more for dying than they do for winning because they're excited when you die. They're like, oh yes, we, we love we love streamers who die. Here we're going to do the next <laughs> Yeah. Now, we also do, if people stream, we do also have a Twitch integration hooked up as well. Um, not for this stream, but, you know, in, uh, with others, you can set it up so that you can actually vote along with the audience on what rewards comes in. You can vote along to send different events and that kind of stuff to you. And you can the, check um, it out on Steam. Exactly. <laughs> oh, look, there we are. There's animated break on. looking all sexy and stuff, too, in our stream. Sorry. The, uh, oh, we just hit a early access like a week or two ago, and I'm oh, nice. not sure we have slept since then. <laughs> the, uh, it's been very exciting. A lot of streams going on. Um, we as devs will often pop in if we see someone streaming. Uh, we made the game to be a fun single-player game, but if you stream, there's extra stuff for you. Um, but since we're making fun of streamer culture, we wanted to make sure we do that. Mm. Yeah, for sure. So what is not in early access that we can expect in the full release? And when is the full release, by the way? Do you have a date for that yet? We're aiming for about a year from now. The, um, but really, it's ready when it's ready. The, um, we're doing some pretty big updates. We've already updated, I think, twice since early access, just even two weeks ago. And then beyond that, we have um, we call them major updates. They come out, you know, we're aiming for one, uh, I don't like promising dates, but like in a couple of weeks, we're aiming to have it out with a brand new class. Um, unlocking some new content, new mutations going in. Uh, over our open beta, we actually really try to make sure we're getting in updates every week, every couple of weeks. Um, we're sort of the little dev team that could. You know, there's three of us on the primary team, but we just crank, crank, crank out, adding in new stuff and listening to feedback, getting on our Discord, all that kind of thing. Wow, it just for you. You're, uh, you're, you're handling this boss like a pro, I gotta say. like. <laughs> I'm a G at these type of games. I'm telling you this now. <laughs> I love arcade games. I love Twitch action games. This game is like right up my alley. I was a bit worried uh, when, it is when when the title came up with a boss, but I don't think I need it to be. Yeah, Justin. I know. Was. Look at that. There's some smooth moves happening everywhere there. <laughs> One of the other fun things you can do as well is uh, for either while streaming or if you just like the look of your own face, you can actually take your webcam and set it to broadcast where the announcer screens are and stuff in the game. Oh, so you can wow. be your own announcer. It's highly, it's highly amusing. We even give you extra bonus points if you like, you know, shatter your own face and a monitor on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. How's the response been so far? Response has been great. Like uh, the we're hundred percent or darn close to it. Positive reviews, which has been fantastic. Oh, Our Discord is buzzing nice. along. So we've been enjoying it. You know, our goal now is really just build, build, build. You know, get people in early access for two reasons. Um, a, you know, it helps us out as indie devs, but also, you know, it's all feedback. It's all making sure that we're listening to what's going on, rolling analytics. You know, making sure the game gets better and better over time. The uh, and we enjoy that. You know, it's a it's a fun process. It's really a lot of fun watching people play, learning from what they do, and also in these kind of combinatorial games where like things really add up by the end of a run. Um, we see new stuff all the time, and we've been working on it for you know a couple, three years, and we get we see new combinations happen in the game because oh, you got this thing, and it adds up with that, adds up with that, and now oh my god, you are spawning out so many bombs, you're blowing yourself into low Earth orbit in the final room, and you know it, neat stuff happens with that. Yeah, so you've mentioned you see, that you're very uh, inspired by Twitch culture. I'd love to know uh, any of your gamers, how have they contributed? Have they like given you any ideas for like enemies you could add or? Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah. Our Discord is um, buzzing. We do a workshop where we'll basically post a question like, hey, well, we're thinking about X, Y, or Z boss, or what would you like to see in the next round of mutations? Or where do you feel like if we're going to devote an extra two weeks on something, what do you feel like, you know, should we do combat polish or should we do, uh, you know, adding in new content or, you know, where, do you, where would you want to see it? Um, and that's been a, a really great experience. 
Um, the other thing, because as devs, if we see someone streaming, we'll often pop in, we can drop in GIFs, we can drop in um, weapons and mutations that we've been working on that are in development, so we can have people try them out and test them out. Um, we can drop nuclear bombs on them. You know, we can mess with <laughs> a lot of stuff with that when we nice. uh, see folks streaming. And so even like amateur streamers, even if like you stream to your cat and nobody else, it's handy. If we see a stream, let us know in our Discord. We'll generally pop in, send you some goodies, maybe try to kill you a little bit. Um, the, uh, but it, it's nice watching that live. It, it's exciting, and it's so cool. And like other people actually see the stuff we've been working on in client yeah. for so long. Yeah. But the, um, as a dev, it's a great era where you can actually sort of interact live with folks as they're doing it. And it's a heck of a lot better than like, Oh, wait for the three survey monkey things to come back, and God knows what it yeah. means when you can just see, oh, now look, this UI element just isn't working. Or, oh, man, people really seem to get this real fast. Very helpful as a dev. You guys definitely Very have fun experience era. with this, for sure. It's yeah, we all came out of a AAA as a rule, so the uh, nice. we have AAA experience, but now we're in this sort of, our last team was 350 people. This one is uh, wow. three. So, small change. What team, like, what, what games did you guys work on? All of us worked on Wildstar, actually. They uh, oh, MMO okay. came out a couple, a couple, three years ago. But yeah. the um, uh, Doug came out of Blizzard before that. Uh, Andrew, our artist, was on uh, was one of the artists on Overwatch. The um, he is in the John Romero studio. Like the um, I did a ton of stuff back in the day because I'm like ancient. The um, <laughs> I did City Heroes, uh, Guild Wars, a uh, uh, bunch of different stuff. The it is um, super vet. Oh god, I'm ancient. Like, and I feel it too, man. It was so much easier to crunch back when I was like 21 than it was when you were 40 something. Get gray hair on the regular night too. It's what the devil do to you. <laughs> nice. It's fun stuff. It's fun stuff. I think you should man, walk you... into the rollers. I think I should that's walk what... into the rollers too. <laughs> that's, that's where we're environmentally conscious. Like the last game is. Uh, that's a recycler. So anything you knock in there, uh, uh, creatures up oh, and right points for you. Can cash down. Yes, exactly. How do or I get to this thing? Chester. Can I get to that chest? Uh, if you have a bomb, which my little uh, oh, video app thing is yeah. covering up. Yeah, bombs will blow up rocks. And now um, take your sword and swing that chest in there, it opens up the chest for you. Nice. Grinds it up and spits out all the stuff in it. That's cool. Like, we like that. It's called meta in these sorts of games. You're like the clever tricks you figure out over yeah. time. We're like, oh, here's a spike chest. It, it damages me to open it up. Well, now I learn, oh, I can hit an enemy into it. Now it'll open up for me. Nice. Um, because you can kind of move around everything in the game, we play with that a ton in terms of like making that physics interact. Right now, on my in my other window, I'm working on a like pachinko room where the room tilts up on an angle, and then all the stuff starts rolling down, and you got to bat it around while it's on an angle. It's very funky. It's a uh, it's amusing. The, one of the great things about this era of like engines we work on Unreal is that um, you can kind of leap into doing all the fun stuff instead of like, oh, I'm making my renderer for the 50th time, and oh, I'm working on a file system, or no, you get to skip all the boring stuff and just add things to the game, add content and all that. That's the fun part of game development. So folks thinking of getting into game development, I, it's a great era for it, man. The fact that yeah. engines get so much of the work done means, it, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it really, it's a, uh, it, it does accelerate the fun stuff. Well, I mean, some people like probably writing renderers and stuff, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. But that ain't me. I like making monsters blow up and dropping nukes on things. Yeah. The discoverability of, like, you know, mastering a skill in this just seems like it'd be, again, up my alley. Yeah, and we unlock That's... a lot of stuff as you go. The, um, uh, you unlock different classes, you unlock different weapons, you unlock um, new events that pop up. The, uh... The way that we did the sort of difficulty scaling is once you beat the game on this is like the same mode, things start unlocking different insanity levels. Now all of a sudden the game starts moving twice as fast. You know, every, everything, you get faster, the enemies get faster. So it's not punitive, you know what I mean? It's not like, hey, we're going to slow you down or, oh, hey, everything's going to move faster, but now you're not. It's like, no, we're accelerating the pace of everything so that it requires more skill to play. It's not just arbitrarily harder, you know. Oh, here, start me off wounded and all that kind of stuff. Um, well, you try to make it fun to advance your, you know, you feel like you've earned something as you're unlocking stuff. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So with any yeah, of your players... Yeah, there's little teleporters, too, so you can move around. What's up? With, with any of your players, um, what, what is the longest run you've seen so far? Like, well, how long has someone survived? The... We've had people have beat the end boss, and we have 
Out of Rolling Our Analytics, we have about three people who have unlocked the final insanity level and been able oh, to beat wow. it on the second character, which is like a kind of hard mode character. Um, and that's out of you know thousands of people who have played. The um, uh, and so a lot of folks are still working through that. Analytics are awesome because even folks who play like just once a month or something, we're getting value out of their play sessions because we find out, oh, this creature's too hard or too many people die here. Um, in fact, we have a blatant bribery system set up where every time we do a big update, like when we do the next update, we're unlocking a new class, um, we give a unique cosmetic to anyone who plays on that new up, uh, update. So if you're in early access now and you play this month, you get a cosmetic unlock that no one in the future is going to be able to get. Um, you get a founder's crown where you can now modify your character and look cooler. Um, and every time we do a big update, we do another one of those. And the reason why is really simple. Um, it is blatant bribery to be like, hey, come on in, play a little bit. Uh, you're feeding our analytics. You're helping make our game better. Um, the You bought into early access, and now, by God, that helps us. So we're going to give you some cool goodies to unlock as you go The um, to, to bribe you into coming back and keeping on checking stuff out month to month. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing um, the game with us. It's, it's it's great. Gone viral. I'm definitely going to be playing it. Um, you can wish list it now. Oh, wait. It's wish list yeah, it now. We're early access. Early access. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. That's yeah. really cool. We're not, we're, it's new to us, too. Like, it's been, it's been <laughs> early access now for like a week and a half or something. Uh, what platforms are you on again? We are on a PC and we're looking at actually hitting the consoles as well. So we're starting yeah. to experiment around or doing some porting, getting on the Switch, maybe, all that kind of stuff. Because it's fun. You can play controller or mouse and keyboard, and we put a lot of work in, so making sure the console play will be fun mm -hmm. as well. Fantastic. Hey, you guys totally rock, by the way. Really fun show. Really been enjoying watching you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for being a the, part of it. Yeah, the game is dope, man. So, uh, yeah. For hey, sure. appreciate it much. All right. <laughs> thank you Talk very you much for joining us. All right, so next up, uh, we are going to be looking at a game called Cloud Gardens. Let's check out the trailer. And we're back. That was the the um, where was it? Well, Cloud Gardens trailer. It looks gorgeous. It looks incredibly beautiful. I love the juxtaposition of the kind of old, crumbling, rusted stuff with you know beautiful vines growing all over them. Yeah, the the style is great and the aesthetic is amazing. Um, we have Thomas on the line. Hey, Thomas, how you doing? How's it going, Thomas? Uh, we can't. You. Let me actually hit the button here. Sorry. We there got you. Go. We got you. I'm good. Cool. How are you guys? Good afternoon. Great. Great. We're doing great. great. So many awesome games. Um, yeah. Amazing yeah. games. Yeah. Um, and yeah, admittedly, cool. yours is one of the ones that I've been looking forward to. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> no when, way, thanks. When, yeah. Immediately when seeing the game, it's like, wow, this is something different. It's very mysterious. You know, uh, I want to check out and see how this cool. game works. So we're going to go right into the gameplay. Yeah. Katie's going to jump in. And could you talk a little bit about the game and how, how you got started? Totally. 
Um, totally. So actually, this game came out of another project. I was working on a game that's like was supposed to be an MMO, like a massive multiplayer game. Um, it was just me. And then at some point, I decided, okay, this is too much. Like, I cannot build an entire MMO by myself. But in that game, there was this little plant simulation that you're looking at right now. And I was like, that's cool. You know, I cannot just throw away this code and, like, just dump two years of, of experimenting. So I tried to figure out a way to, to build a game out of just this plant simulation. And that game is Cloud Gardens. It's that's really cool. gorgeous. Um, I, I have to say, one of my quarantine projects has been indoor gardening. <laughs> I think I'm really showing oh, nice. my age there, but um, I'm really into vining plants especially, so it's really cool that yeah. I can grow so many in this game. Yeah, um, I think I, there is for some reason a lot of, uh, let's say, people have more affinity with growing plants these days. It's kind of making yeah. a comeback, like, you know, having plants in your house or uh, if you have a garden, kind of tending to that a little bit more. Yeah, I think uh, my theory is though, there's a lot of like sad stuff happening in the world right now, but being able to see something thrive during a pandemic, I think just speaks to people. Absolutely. Um, even though in this game, it's not as much about gardening in a sense of like, you have to water your plants, you have to feed them. <laughs> um, it's really about the aesthetics, but I think uh, that's a very important part as well. Just the way that things look with plants around or on them. So you worked in on Kingdom? Your team worked on Kingdom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I worked on Kingdom for about seven years. Wow. And then I wanted okay. to do something new. So I still try to... Um, I really like the pixel art aesthetic. Yeah. So that's one of the things tell. that I started out with. Like, how can I um, how can I work in a certain kind of pixel art style, but still have it be 3D? Um, you know, obviously not all the pixels are going to be like aligned or like the same size but how can you kind of have this aesthetic where things are like blocky and you know it's like interpretation is left to the the player in a way that's what really stood out to me about it i'm like i'm an artist also a 3d artist that's where i started and so like uh, an env environment cool. artist actually so seeing your low res Sweet. texture maps over the the models was very interesting because you did like a, the the your interpretation of what it should look like is 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 very intuitive. I haven't seen it too too often. Maybe I don't know if you've seen the new System Shock or the uh, the System Shock remake. It kind of has that, you know, um, uh, like eight bit style, sixteen bit style um, texture yeah. mapping. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. I think you know the answer is not always in more polygons and higher resolution textures. <laughs> It's also about just what you are depicting and kind of like what impression does that give uh, the player? You know, what do they feel when they see it? And, uh, so you have um, a kind of post, uh, you, you have kind of a post-apocalyptic feel going on here. I'd love to know what your inspirations were behind that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if like there are subreddits for like you know. What are they called like abandoned porn and stuff mm, like that you yeah. know it's like abandoned landscapes overgrown factories all these things and these are like i mean i love this stuff as well like it's just for some reason it's just so so pleasing to look at and i kind of really wanted just to capture that feeling you know like what if the what if this abandoned landscape was not just just the backdrop of a game but what if like that was the game it's not just like, oh, you have this abandoned factory that's overgrown and now you can shoot a bunch of zombies, but actually playing with this abandoned landscape somehow. I, I just opened up a bunch of cards with different plants on them. What can you tell me about this? Yeah, so, um, here you can pick which seed you are growing to play with. I think on oh. this level you're best off with the green one, the third one from the right. Yeah, that one. Oh, this one? Or potentially all the way on the right. Yeah, this one This one would work oh, well. Yeah. This one has flowers on it, though. I'm going to try this one. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I didn't know you could like choose different plants. It's so awesome. <laughs> so I'm kind of hoping, or we're kind of hoping to um, trick players into being creative a little bit. <laughs> like uh, maybe initially there are some objectives and it's like click this, click that, get a new seed, etc. But then hopefully um, they start enjoying the creative process as much as completing the objectives that the game has to offer. Uh, and it's a it's a nice kind of feeling to make something and like be proud of it. Like, hey, yeah, I created yeah. this. That's cool. It looks like it. it, it... Oh, go ahead. go ahead. If you click the seed in the bottom right of your screen, you can grab oh. that seed that you just selected. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
and this is like my flowering vines. Oh, where did it go? Oh, Ooh, it might have bounced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, there we go. Nice. Well, I, I feel like a mother to these plants. Like <laughs> I grew them. <laughs> I like that it's like a snapshot, it, like we were talking about that abandoned porn type of thing. It, it has like a snapshot feel of this particular abandoned piece, which is cool that you rotate, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I feel like yeah. I'm we creating a work of art here. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, the game is very forgiving, so you can be as precise as you want. Some people prefer to align every object, and some people prefer to have it more like haphazardly, mm -hmm. you know, placed in different directions. Um, yeah, kind mm -hmm. of different players have different different ways of, of building this stuff. And what you were saying about it being like a small scene that you rotate. Um, initially, we played with much bigger landscapes. We had like a huge factory that you would go from one side to the other. Oh, wow. But for some reason, we found that it's more satisfying if the landscape is somewhat smaller. Because you have maybe more ownership over the results. You're yeah. kind of more zoomed in on a couple small things that you're doing. And you have affinity um, for it too, it feels like when you're... Yeah, kind of like that, it, yeah. exactly. You you know everything that you placed, you kind of keep track of it. Like, this is really your little landscape that you built. And that, did you change the name to uh, Cloud Gardens based on that? Having this like one little set? Or was it always uh, Cloud Gardens? Um, it was kind of always Cloud Gardens from the beginning. Cool. Um, yeah, I think so. That kind of just stuck. Nice. Uh, I, I, I like was fumbling at first. I was like, Cloud Atlas? Oh, <laughs> damn it. <Let> me... <laughs> yeah. And there's gardens. also a lot of cloud, a lot of garden games right now. Games that have garden in the title. That's true. It's, that's uh, true. Like Kingdom, maybe it's not the most SEO optimized title. <laughs> but, but this game is we'll very unique, though, for sure. I'm, I haven't seen anything like it. It looks. It's recognizable from looks, and that that works well, I think, too. When you post screenshots, it's mm -hmm. you know it's easy to kind of see. Oh, it's that game, even if you don't know exactly um, the name of it. Yeah, your Instagram must be popping with these gifts. Yeah, I was gonna say all we have to do is post <laughs> gifts, and that, that's your marketing strategy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just... beautiful. Screenshot yeah. Saturday, you must be killing it. Oh yeah. Our Instagram's got all of 50 followers, but we do try to do the screenshot Saturday and that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think you'll have more followers after this. Yes, let's hope so. We're Cloud Gardens on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout Plug that it. out. <laughs> uh, we're a super small team. Um, it's usually around four people. Um, me, someone doing music, level design, and uh, 3D art. Um, but it does mean that some of the st some stuff gets left by the wayside. Like we're not mm -hmm. um, always um, able to do like you know participate in a lot of these screenshots on Saturday and out yeah, outputting sure. a lot of posts and stuff. Um, we're really focused on the core the core game things. And did you mention when you're uh, releasing yet? Totally. Um, so we're thinking probably around summer 2021. Maybe earlier, but I don't nice. think anybody's ever like released a game <laughs> earlier than this. <laughs> you could be the first to do well, so. Yeah, I could be. We could be the first. Um, <laughs> yeah, early access has been really good. Um, we're getting some crazy nice. feedback from players. There's a sandbox mode in the game where people are just building insane things that we never thought something of that size would be possible. Uh, and now we quickly try to cater to them, like give them better tools in the sandbox to build bigger stuff. Oh, that's awesome. So they're like bigger snapshots? Or like, how is, how is that? So the sandbox mode, um, you start actually with a completely clean slate. Okay. And you get all the items um, that you've played with so far to just build something up from scratch. Um, so for example, um, I don't know if you in the previous level there was like this abandoned car, or there's like an abandoned train, and all these props you just get to play with in the sandbox, and you can stack them any way you like, and then you put plants on them. But That's people have been taking fine. it really far. They've been building huge contraptions and towers and weird sceneries. That's awesome. That's super cool. When did, when did you release on, on Early Access? About a month ago. Oh, okay. Congrats. September, yeah, September 9th. Thanks. Yeah. It's been a ride. Fun. 
Yeah, so everybody go grab that on Early Access now. It's on our Steam page, too. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much cool. for sharing. Uh, Cloud yeah, thank Garden. you guys. Thank you for joining yeah, us. Yeah, have fun with the rest of the stream. <laughs> yeah, it was for nice sure. to talk to you. Yeah, yeah we'll boost thank that you. Instagram, you know? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're back. Yeah, so next up, uh, we'll be talking to the developer of Axiom Verge 2. But first, the trailer. And that was the highly anticipated Axiom Verge 2 trailer. Right now, we don't have game. We're not going to be playing the game, but we're going to be talking to Thomas Happ uh, from Happ Games. Sorry. Thomas Happ Games Studio. What is up? What's the hat? Hey. She said, what's the hat? What is what's the hat? I'm sure it's you hear happening. that all the time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but how's it going? It's, it's going good. Yeah. You know, we just, uh, unfortunately, we announced a a delay we had originally wanted the game to release in uh in late 2020 but we've moved it to potentially earlier uh 2021 so that's you know that's what's going on there but uh everything is going well it's not like there's any yeah. you know there aren't any deep issues with the game or anything like that it's just taking taking its time to be developed yeah. it's just more time to make it better right yeah yeah i mean i you know, I technically have a full game in there with all the bosses and everything. And uh, Dan Edelman is the only person who's played through it. And it just, you know, it just sort of ends. It's not, uh, I don't have the story elements in there or anything. So, you know, the next few months, I'm just going to be adding in all the things that are missing and making it, you know, from a, a pre-alpha into a, a beta and then a final release. Yeah, shout out to Dan. He's, he's awesome. It's great that you guys, like, joined up you know, right as he was uh, leaving Nintendo to work on Axiom Verge 1. I first, like, heard of it through Dan, um, and I played it at, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, at um, IndieK, like, 2014? Is that correct? Or 2015? When, when was the first one released? Uh, it came out in, uh, I think it was, like, March 29th or March 31st, um, 2015. 2015. Um, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, and it it had been an indicate. I can't remember which year because it, we released it on different platforms, different yeah. years. Uh, so it might have been at indicate for a certain platform that same year or a later year. Yeah, and it was like one of the first Metroidvanias that initially launched. Uh, from an indie game developer and kind of set the bar high for Metroidvanias coming out. Like, how how's your experience been, you know, with, uh, you know, I mean, the gratification, you you created a powerhouse in the in the area. Can you talk to us about that? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that was kind of totally a surprise. You know, I, I had thought, you know, like, people will play this or not. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect it to become sort of like uh, a benchmark or anything along those lines. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, it was one of those, I don't know if they like zeitgeist or, uh, you know, just right mm -hmm. time, right place, you know, it happened to come out um, at a time when there was a, a, is the word dearth? Is that, is that correct? There, there weren't that many, games yeah. like yeah, it at the right. time yeah um, <laughs> games <laughs> and uh uh you, you know it's funny if i had been slower in development by a couple of years i it probably would have released like during the main flood um but it you know it happened that uh 
just everything aligned. It came out at the right time. What do you think about uh, games in the genre that have come out since then, like Dead Cells or Chasm or like any of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, I really like them. Um, I'm, I'm great friends with the uh, the Chasm uh, developers, um, James, um, and and his wife Trang. Uh, they, the first time I was ever at E3, which was I think 2014, um, they, their, the Chasm booth was like the row behind mine. So like I met with them and like we went out to dinner and hung out a lot. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a different feeling like with indie developers, because, uh, when you're working for a big triple A studio, it's just like, you know, the people in your giant studio and that's it. Whereas with indie developers, you're more likely to want to meet each other and like talk to each other and be like asking each other for help. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't, it's not like I know personally all indie developers, you know, I know some people think that, <laughs> yeah. think that we know like... everyone knows each other, but uh, it, it is more like that, I think, than it is in the AAA uh, scene. For sure. Just like yeah. we were saying earlier, like indie, the indie dev scene is a family, really. We help yeah. each other out. Um, but yeah, given, yeah, you just told us that story. I'm curious, did you ever spend any time in AAA? Uh, I did, yeah. So before I was working you know on my own um i worked at at electronic arts i worked on the tiger woods uh series and um i worked on a uh uh nfl street three and then and then i worked at petroglyph they're not quite triple a they're more like you know double a or triple b or something like that <laughs> um make, you know working on uh real-time strategy games um and that, that was still, I mean, it's still a fairly large studio. I think at the largest, it was like a hundred people. And then it, it, it went down from there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I pretty much went the gamut from, from big and small, uh, to myself. How has that process been? Cause I know that you're, you're a one man team, right? You're doing all of the coding and the sprite work. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. How, how has it, the journey been? from Axiom Verge 1 to Axiom Verge 2? Uh, so it's quite a bit different between the two, I would think, because with Axiom Verge 1, um, I spent the most time in development developing it on the side and not mm. thinking of it as uh, my livelihood or anything along those lines. Um, it was just a hobby uh, that I liked doing. And then the, in the last year of development, I, I was able to get a uh, uh, like a collaboration type deal with Sony where they, um, you know, were going to give me an advance on the royalties and that helped me to be able to afford to work on it full time for a year. Um, and that's, that's when it, you know, it came together. Whereas Axiom Verge 2 was more like, I basically used the profits of Axiom Verge 1 to support myself and you know, I'm working the whole time knowing like, this is how I'm going to pay my bills, you know, after it releases. Um, and uh, so it's a different, there's, there's a lot more pressure on it, I would say. That makes sense. I'm curious, how do you keep yourself afloat right now? I mean, you, you've been developing this full time for years now, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's all from, from the profits of Axiom Verge 1. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, congrats so, on the success yeah, of that, for sure. Yeah, so. you, you did really well. So, you know, shortly after Axiom Verge 1, like, released, it was just like a few months later, I started working on Axiom Verge 2. And uh, Dan Edelman, who's my business marketing person, is, in my opinion, he's kind of like a genius at just finding ways to make more money at things. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, it released on, you know, various different platforms and... Uh, uh, he came up with the contracts for each of them, um, and uh, each time, each time it released on a new platform, it was like releasing to a new audience. So it's basically a new launch. So you you get, you know, an in, influx of cash from that. And then he, Dan, is also really good at just finding other deals. Like uh, a while ago, um, it was on uh, the Epic Game Store, you know, um, and uh, 
and then it, it you know in America and then like it had another release on the Epic Game Store in China <laughs> I think it was nice um, and it was just sort of like I you know how would I ever think to do these things on my own but Dan is always like putting out the feelers for like what people need what they're looking for uh, so yeah so I've been able to feed myself during development and uh, uh, you know probably for a little bit after even if you know suddenly everything halted and I couldn't continue. Um, so that's that's been really great. That's awesome. Living so, the indie dream. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about Axiom Verge two. What is the, what is the difference between one and two, and where do you like? Where are you trying to go with the game? Um, so you know, a lot of uh, a lot of what go, like goes into determining what I make the game to be. It's like partially what I think would be best for the player, and then partially is what I think would be most interesting for me. And I don't really want to. I'd say like the easiest thing would be if I just reskinned Axiom Verge one and I changed the graphics and maybe change the order you get things in, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like if you compare like Metroid Zero Mission to Metroid Fusion, like yeah. they're, they're kind of you have a lot of the same items, but everything's in a different order. But I wanted to actually, you know, do something that would keep me more entertained. So it's there are quite a bit of changes and, uh, you know, maybe like 50% is different and 50% is the same uh, with this game. Uh, you can, if you saw from the trailer, it's, there's a lot more outdoor scenery. Um, there is uh, uh, a, a different focus on items. You know, one, one thing that happened in Axiom Verge one was there's about, I think there's like 20 different weapons in the game, 20 different guns. And uh, I had a lot of complaints, like you just find these extra guns and then, they don't do anything uh, for, you know, purpose of game progression. They're just there for you to have fun shooting. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a valid complaint, like in a game where every item is usually there to, uh, you know, in a genre where each item is there to kind of like unlock us, uh, progress in a certain way or give you a new way to move that there were all these weapons that were kind of just there to shoot enemies. So um, I try to move away from that and, uh, you know, go more with, you know, melee-ish and, you know, other kinds of weapons and uh, just try and, try and come up with something different that people hadn't seen before to give you a reason to play the second game um, over, you know, or in addition to playing the first game. So how's how can you talk about this? I know there's secrecy behind the story because you want to reveal too much. But at f the first game you play is, played as Trace, and now you're a different character. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah. So uh, in the first game, you know, in the there's like an intro cutscene that shows Trace when he's on Earth, and it's like 2005 or something, and he does an experiment and it blows up, and then he wakes up and he's in the other world. Um, this. This game kind of it it follows a similar pattern. Uh, you're you're a character on Earth. It's a bit further in the future, um, and uh, her name is Indra, and she's sort of like this um, uh, wealthy tech CEO. Um, uh, you know, has her own helicopter, has uh, uh, like owns you know various companies, and um, uh, she's exploring this research base in Antarctica when she discovers, uh, you know, something is amiss and then eventually ends up in this other world. The other world is a lot, looks a lot like Earth, so it might not initially be apparent that she's entered another world. But um, as you can see from the trailer, it's got, you know, a few a few things, a lot of, you know, robots and, and that sort of thing in it that we don't have here in uh, uh, California <laughs> or w wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> That's super interesting. Yeah, the aesthetic looks interesting and like super sci-fi. I really, really dig that. I mean, not that Axie Verge One wasn't, but you could tell it, tell off the bat, you know. So, um, you said you're. It got pushed back a little bit. Um, what platforms are you releasing on initially? Uh, so so far, we've only announced a Nintendo Switch. That doesn't mean we're only releasing on Nintendo Switch. Um, but, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the first one Nintendo was like really excited about having the Axiom Verge trailer be part of one of their, uh, Nintendo direct indie themed streams. So, 
um, we were like, okay, yeah, you know, that sounds good. You know, the Switch is a <laughs> yeah. really good, a really good platform for this style of game, the, the retro pixel art uh, type of game. So we were pretty comfortable saying, okay, well, you know, we'll release it on Switch uh, and it will be the first or among the first of platforms that it comes out for. Yeah, it was so exciting. It came out of nowhere, you know. Like I was like, "What? This is," you know what I mean. And I, I, I thought you were working on it, but I, I had no idea. And it was, it was a pleasant surprise to see that you guys were launching on the Switch soon. Yeah, it was pretty hush for the past like five years. I couldn't talk to anyone about yeah. what I was doing all day. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's out there now, so that's a good feeling. What's cool. it like being an indie on the Switch? Um, it's this, I mean, I think it's the same as being an indie on, on anything else. Um, okay. you know, there's, there's some minor, uh, when it comes to consoles, I would say like any console has the same kind of weird, like quirks to it. That's, uh, that like working on PC doesn't, um, and it's, it just means that you need to learn, you know, a few things that Nintendo does different, differently from how, uh, Sony does it or Microsoft does it. Um, you know, probably the the biggest thing is just uh, getting yourself into that that ecosystem. You know, their their uh, console the console platforms are much more careful about um, you know kind of like who they let into their their shop. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, I think the hardest thing is probably getting that relationship. In like in my case, Dan already had all the relationships because he worked there. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that that part of of things, you know, came came a bit easier for me. But um, you know, the, and then and then the other time you notice the difference is when it's time to ship the game. Uh, you know, if you're on Steam, you just sort of like press the make it live button. Um, whereas uh, on a console store, there's a whole like a TRC like certification process that you need to go through. And uh, that can be pretty stressful and nerve wracking and, you know, can cause the game to be delayed because, you know, you you did something that wasn't exactly according to what their specification said. Like I used the word up in Axiom Merge 1 and you're not supposed to use the word up. You're supposed to like show a icon of the, the controller pressing up. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> definitely familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you were, um, during that time you became a parent, how has family life affected development? Is this correct? <laughs> Am I that's, right? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a five-year-old son. You know, he was, uh, he was born a few months after Axiom Verge 1 released. Um, it's, yeah, it's like a whole different game when you have a family versus when you're working on your own. Um, you know, you can't. Uh, just like burn the midnight oil, like ev every day, all day, you know, for, for weeks on end anymore, you know, there's a lot of other responsibilities that you have. Um, and, uh, you know, even just the general since because I'm an indie and I'm working at home. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of people are finding this out now that COVID is around when you're working at home. Um, and you have a family like, whether you know, no matter how hard you try, you are going to spend part of your work day, like going and helping out with the kids, helping out with, you know, any kind of emergencies that come up, uh, you know, driving folks around and that kind of thing um, that like you would have to find some other way to work around if you were at an office elsewhere. Um, so that that makes things a bit different, too. Um, although now that everyone is, you know, experiencing COVID, <laughs> it's kind of like everyone sort of gets to know what it's like to be an indie now. <laughs> that's pretty, that's hilarious. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we're looking forward to Axiom Verge 2. We want to thank you, Thomas, for jumping on board. Where can we find you in your game? Uh, so um, uh, social media wise, uh, you got it down there at Axiom Verge. <laughs> that's me on, on Twitter. I'm not really on Instagram. I have an Instagram, but it's, I don't really use it so much. Um, and uh, there's an Axiom Verge 2 uh, website, www.axiomverge2, and that's where uh, I'm going to announce everything. There's a blog there with uh, that you can click on as a separate link, takes you to all of the announcements that we're making for the game. Cool. Thank you so much. It's, it's amazing. I can't wait for Axiom Verge 2. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, talking us through your experiences. It's been really fascinating. All right. yep, thank you. All right, man. Take care, Thomas. All right, take care, everyone. So that is the end of the show. Thank you so much, Thomas and Dan, for showing Axiom Verge 2 and talking and chopping it up. It's been an amazing experience. We had over 50 games, interviews. It was great. How, I, how'd I you have feel about too that? many games to play now. I, I don't know how I'm going to find the time to play all of these games. They just, they all look so incredible. Yeah, we yes, it's it's crazy. And like we played so many games, it was it was awesome going through them, playing them for the first time sometimes, and having the developers walk uh, through them with us. We want to shout out our sponsors. Uh, without you guys, it w this would not happen. Humble, Modern Wolf, Tiny Build, Akupara, um, another indie, Astro, Goblins, Graffiti Games, Head Up. Uh, Kickstarter, Razor, Super, those awesome guys, White Fawn. And we also want to thank our streaming partners, um, Twitch, IGN, GameSpot, and then of course Steam. You can wishlist those games on the Mix Next Steam page. We want to thank Wilmer Sounds, AV Society, all the folks in the mix who worked with us to make this happen, and the viewers, of course. It's been an amazing experience. Thank you so much. And oh yeah, follow us on social media at Indie Exchange, at Media Indie Exchange on Instagram and Twitter. And then also on Twitch. Where can we find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm Katie Lux. Um, and I'm on Instagram. I'm Misery Head there. You know, that, that, <laughs> that's my inner golf coming out. Um, I think that's about it, but yeah. I publicly. Well, thank you so much. Thank we'll you, you everybody. Peace. <laughs>